This is our special compact to mid-size SUV comparison with the VW Tiguan versus the Škoda Kodiak versus the Peugeot 3008 versus Toyota RAV4 versus Mazda CX-5 versus Honda CRV versus Kia Sportage versus Hyundai Tucson. We have it here in the head-to-head -head comparison with the previous generation Tiguan. So we have also both generations Tiguan here, previous and the all new one in here. It's also very interesting. And finally, versus Nissan X-Trail, or as it is called in the Northern American market, Nissan Rogue, respectively. They all represent, so to speak, SUV that can do everything. So right in the middle, not too big, not too small. For European taste, you can maybe say already mid-size SUV, for Northern American taste is rather compact SUV. But which one actually is best in which feature? Which one should you go for? Let's dig into the details, let's go. Here now in the new generation, the Tiguan wants to set a new mark and saying, hey, I'm top of the segment here. But is it really true? We'll find out with Thomas Nautgefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with the all new Tiguan generation, different trims, Different engine versions we drive today as well. And here you can see this one is the R line. There's a lot of sporty accentuations going on in the lower part, high gloss black and this mesh front grille. And we have here as a comparison the elegance. This is the other top trim, more this horizontal focus, more chrome styling. So yeah, a little bit more elegant approach. And the base version would be closer to this than it would be to this one. Here the Arlen also has more high gloss black all over the vehicle. And in general, the styling. Before the Tiguan was more like, I would say a little bit more you know, angular and so on. Now more round shapes to improve aerodynamics. So it went down from 0.33 to 0.28 in the CD value, which is good. CD value always better when it's lower. Not necessarily in the... 20 inch wheels, R line, and so on. This is worse aerodynamics wise, but the overall aerodynamic form has really massively been improved. You have these air curtains here, air going through here and here, going through the wheel arches, then also a more round hood. Then here it's closed actually. This whole light area is closed, you can see, and more aerodynamic optimizations across the vehicle. And you can also see that here, this light integration, it starts here. Then there's the light strip, the illuminated VW logo, not yet. It will follow later. They couldn't get it ready for the Tiguan when it was launched right now, but then it will come at a later stage. And the light logic is you have a base headlamp, already LED. Then you have a higher performing LED. And this one is the optional optional matrix LED, so-called IQ light for best high beam performance. And then you also have the cascading turning indicators, both in the front and in the rear. Oh, and Leah found some Easter eggs. Look at that from the outside, hard to see, just when you have the hand behind it. There we go, there's the Tiger. You could also better see it from the inside. Aww. And the other side has an Iguana. Hmm, so cute, but why is that? And the reason for that is that Tiguan is a combination, the name of Tiger and Iguana. Tiger, Iguana, Tiguan, you know. I think it's nice to implement that giving. And now the most important thing is, it's not an option. It's not only in the R-Line or in the Elegance. It's even in the base trim. That's something special for Volkswagen, right? Major step forward also as for the noise insulation. The soundproof front windshield is standard and then option you can get an acoustic package and here at the side windows front and rear we have then the dual insulation also equipped with our test cars today. 4 meters 54 or 179 inches is the length of the new Tiguan just slightly longer than the previous generation. This one here the elegance version or also the base trim would have the matte wheel arches here. Wheels from 17 to 20 inch these ones here are 19 inch wheels in this rather closed aerodynamic design. Then more of this matte cladding here all around. But already here in the elegance, you have this shiny frame trim around the windows. And you can see this is more or less a conservative design. You have a dropping line right here. More form for this function that you have space on the interior. And now coming to the R line, if we move over to our second vehicle, you can see more high gloss black, for example, around the wheel arches. These ones are also the optional 20-inch wheels. 
with the R-Line, 19 would be standard, 20 then also optional for the R-Line, here in the black styling, the most sinister styling R-Line badge. Once again, the closed look right here and aerodynamic optimizations here. They make the car longer here, also with the top spoiler, so the wind can better flow away right there. That makes so much difference. Also here, see these edges? right here this is also optimization for aerodynamics and it's actually even more important that the car is not getting pulled from the wind in the rear than how much it pushes in the front so rear aerodynamic optimization is actually the most important thing very interesting elegance here the matte more plastic styling with the chrome accentuation whereas we have in the r-line once again high gloss black and this meshed grille structure, once again, for the sport, yeah, more sinister look. And not sure if you can really see that, but the R-Line top spoiler here is even a little bit longer. So although the R-Line in general is worse as for aerodynamics, this longer spoiler would be then a little bit better. Oh, very important, by the way, this middle light strip, and also later when the logo is illuminated, will also be active while driving when it's dark and the main headlamp unit is also on. Pretty cool, right? Technology-wise is actually the biggest news, the DCC. We have both vehicles here equipped with that, the diesel we're driving later as well. DCC has been upgraded to a DCC Pro that now employs a two-valve system. So it's more elaborate and can rule more between comfort and sportiness. And even in the infotainment system, you can not only choose presets, but also individually rule that. Here, this new central knob, either manual volume adjustment, that's good, would work when I have your music running, and then you press it, and then you can either have here the driving mode selection directly, comfort sport, and so on, so easy to select while driving. You can also slide in this one here, and then select the ambient lighting modes. Not sure if it's necessary to have that here, but yeah, it's an interesting function for sure, like this. So, and then you see what you are selecting, but you can also go deeper in the menu. And then here with the individual modes, this is just information, but here with the individual mode, I can have more settings. And then you can also individualize this DCC setting from minus to plus. This is the most comfortable one, this is the sporty ones. And the interesting thing is, it's not only here then. So when you, for example, set it here, it rules between approximately this spectrum. When you have it here, it's like in this spectrum. So it's always plus and minus, but this is kind of like the preset. However, I personally recommend rather a comfortable setting to have an elaborated ride. Still, we'll find out more when we drive the vehicle. Key fob, high gloss black, not my favorite. Door closing sound, VW is always famous for that. And here, it's also good. Nothing super special, but good overall. Here inside, this is like a bright trim. The R-line would be darker. Deco element is already right here. I love the door inside handle, which is in this matte silver trim, actually. And what's actually quite cool here, at the inside, we have felt covering at the inside door pockets. Elegance trim with the elegance entry badge. Also here, the normal steering wheel with real buttons on the steering wheel. So they have returned to real buttons for all versions, actually. VW says they want to use more real buttons. Again, good decision. Also, we here, our community in Autofuel has massively influenced that. And then the R-Line steering wheel would have here a perforation and also a logo in the lower part. Other than that, the steering wheel is the same. And then these are the Ergo Active seats. You would start base with fabric seats. Then there are usually microfiber seats for elegance. And this is the optional animal skin trim. Here in the bright styling, you can also get the dark stylings, of course. The thing is that VW in their ID models, in the electric models, go forward in all animal-free and sustainable materials. Whereas in the models with still have combustion in the like, what the hell, we don't care about sustainability. And that is not consistent. Why would you do that? Why are only electric vehicles supposed to be better as for the rest of the materials and the features? I don't get it. This is definitely something to criticize. However, you can get uh, really nice microfiber seats here also for the Tiguan. Um, they perform even better than these ones here. They are softer and more comfortable and more breathable, actually. Then here, with 189, six for two, lot of room still above my head. You can also get the panoramic roof still. Steering wheel, manual control, in and out, up and down. So the base ergonomics 
are actually really good. You can find a good position also as a tall driver. And uh, Leah has already seen that. Yeah, I saw that with the camera here. The switch gear, like in the ID7, forward, reverse, directly here at the steering column. That cleans up the lower middle console where we showed you that new you know, functionality button. Interior cockpit overview here in this trim is bright here. And also this illuminated trim here with the elegance version. So you have this decor element, Tiguan it says. In the R-Line it says the R-Batch. So it looks a little bit different then, but it's only available in the top trim versions actually. Then 13 inch would be standard. This is here the optional 15 inch screen. It's optional for all versions actually. Yeah, hmm, typical options policy. The sliders are now illuminated. It's good to have them versus only in the screen, but manual would be better there. In the very, very new generations of the Volkswagen vehicles, the manual climate knobs will be coming back also thanks to our coverage. Then here you can also directly select the seat cooling, for example. And here the digital instruments behind that. This is covered with the anti-reflective coating that you can better see them. It also has more a matte appearance, I would say. And you can also change, for example, the view in the digital instruments. Sorry for that spontaneous burst of rage. Here, when you have a door opened, then it does not work to change the view. You have to click OK first. Then you can also switch the middle view. Here, for example, also with a full map like this. It's somehow also complicated what you want to have there because then you have to go back or here to go close again. You can control the inside parts actually. Um, yeah, but then you can also go to the outside here on the right. You can go to the left part. I think a little bit over engineered. I think others could say it's highly customizable. The infotainment system now has this new back and also has more CPU power, for example. And then here, this is also a main menu you can select. The plug-in hybrid has the static air conditioning. You can even select the zones you want to preheat or pre-cool then. And now where can I adjust the head-up display? Hey, Ida. Head-up display higher. You can adjust settings on the screen. So then it brings me to this menu at least, and I can adjust the position. There we go. And my favorite feature for the helpless is you can pick this snow mode. So when everything is white, then the number here, the speed turns to blue. I would maybe drive it like this always. Hey, Ida. Hey, Idaho. Ah, wait, it's, it's hello. Hello, Ida. Why do you keep interrupting me? Oh, that's something I still need to learn. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I said, right? Yeah, so, yes, the software has become better, definitely. But that's something that uh, sometimes it gets activated and records everything you're saying here. Um, oh, that's something I still need to learn. Yeah, you know, and then you not you haven't activated it yourself, but just becomes active by this activation word and then it's telling you something. So what I usually do that I deactivate this activation words and I just use the button on the steering wheel then for the input for the voice uh, system. That's usually better with most vehicles. With the console space above and then underneath two inductive charging pads. They charge quickly, very nice and are also cooled and USB-C charging. So here this lower middle console you have these sliders here in the front. You can also take them out completely. Then you have the cup holders at this moment far in the back. Hmm, but does it really make sense? However, you have the choice. You can put this one out. Then, okay, well, I know how to do that yet. Then here you can put this one here and put it to the forward position. And I think that would be, there we go, more suitable for bottles in the front. And then, something I still need to learn. Not sure why the voice assistant. Stop. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, you see, um, yeah, this is definitely better now, is it? Rear doors, hard pack in the front door. It's soft. Here is actually hard pack. Huh? <laughs> huh? Well, for that price, I would expect something different. And then here, the rear bench, you can slide it forward or backward. You can also adjust the angle here like this. Um, Wait a minute. 
Ah, there we go. So like this, or all the way back. Then the middle part, slide down, and you have um, <laughs> ah. Ah. Yeah, I remember with the static review, I had some problems with that as well. So these are the cup holders. Hmm. Let's say I wouldn't exactly say I'm very convinced of this new mechanism. Let's take it that way. So then here, the other seat, you can see how the angle is varying. There we go. And we can also slide this one forward or backward. And when I'm in a backward position and I'm driving on the passenger's... I'm driving on the passenger seat? What am I talking about? When I'm driving in the driver's seat, that makes sense. Here, there's still a lot of legroom left, no problem. And headroom here with one A9 or six for two, also no problem. So it's a good offering of space here in the rear. And then we have also USB-C chargers and also seat heating for the rear when this are powered trunk and luggage capacity. It's also cool to do it here, two in a row, <laughs> two for one. 650 liters for the normal setup, 475 for the plug-in, but what are the differences here? Normal combustion engine, a meter or 40 inches in width, that's the same. The length, 88 centimeters or 34 inches. It's just more luggage capacity because you have more room here in this area. And we also have, for example, you can get a 220 or 230 volt normal plug to fold the seats, pull this one here left, pull this one here on the right. Why doesn't it fold? Ah, okay. Yeah, that's because the electric seat function that goes automatically back, I'll soon fix that. First of all, here underneath, more space than in the combustion engine version. You can also house a complete replacement tire here because here, the subwoofer, when you have that option, is now in this form here, so it leaves space for a replacement tire or for the plug-in hybrid battery soon going to show that to you. So I need to put that electric seat more forward that the rear bench can actually fall down. That's the thing with these electric functions. So they automatically go back for comfort seating. And then we go here. This is then the length as I would be seating as a tall adult, 170 in meters, that's 67 inches. And now the question is, what about the plug-in hybrid? Let's move over. So on top here, it's the same just here on the side because they put the small, the 12 volt starter battery right here in the left. So for the plug-in hybrid, they had to move the fuel tank. It's right here in this box. Underneath this box, you can find the high voltage battery from the plug-in hybrid. But you can still have some space here for charging cables. So this is then actually the main difference. As for engines, well, I love that dual shot here. Right, always. <laughs> then we have a 1.5 TSI, and it's the base engine, two horsepower specs. In the 150 horsepower specs, it's around nine seconds in the acceleration figure. Always MHF, mild hybrid system, and also the dual clutch transmission, seven speed DSG. On that base of the 1.5 TSI is also the plug in hybrid version, new with a 20 kilowatt hour net battery, 80 kilometers or 50 miles of rear-world realistic range. So massively improve the plug-in hybrid electric capacity. It's also important for taxation reasons, for example, especially in Germany. Then there will also be a two-liter TSI, both with all-wheel drive, and the two-liter TDI, the diesel, also in two horsepower specs. The bigger one we also drive today, 193 horsepower, also with all-wheel drive, the latter one. The big diesel is then the one with the highest towing capacity at 2.3 tons. The other one then depending on the engine version a little bit less. So all of the engine specs have more or less their advantages or disadvantages. Working with Thomas' driving lounge or New Tegon, testing different engine versions. Here starting with an all-wheel drive version of the TDI. So 7.7 .7 seconds in the acceleration figure, so a little bit stronger and let's see how that behaves. From 40 kilometers an hour, we'll accelerate it out. Let's go. Plop, 100. Oh, that even triggered the Lia meter just a little bit, a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, she's used to like really sporty vehicles now. Yeah. yeah, so decently quick. And when we're driving in the city and so on, then you hear this typical diesel nailing, we say in, in Germany. So yeah, rather unpleasant sound indeed.
but here on the motorway the difference is rather minor. I was also picking up the sport mode, I can go back to the comfort mode, then the RPMs go a little bit lower, and then actually at higher speeds the difference between the engines is not that relevant, I would say. And here now on the motorway, one kilometers an hour, we can also experience the driving assists. Here travel assist is also then upgraded for this vehicle. You set it here, you pick the different mode, travel assist, limiter or ACC, and then you set your speed then also on the steering wheel and here you set different 10 kilometer steps and with resume you can set one kilometer steps above here at the moment 110 and it's really good to have the real buttons back for all versions so it's easy to press these real buttons then and let's see how good does it handle it also shows me a green steering wheel symbol that means it's the active lane keeping assist so the car is doing that semi-autonomously so it's level two and so far let's see how the car is being centralized quite well now that comes like this slight bend in the motorway let's see how the steam reacts if there's any hectic movement and so on yeah that's actually very smooth yeah flawless that's really good. The steering in, indeed I would like more feedback but what you can also do is go to an individual mode and in the individual mode, um, yeah, to do that while driving is a little bit complicated here, you have to go there. And then you can set the, the, the DCC, the adaptive suspension, but you could also put, for example, a soft suspension, but then the steering to a sportier node. And yeah, that's maybe also a, a good choice in long term to have your personal individual mode. Oh, thank you for the heads up. <laughs> Interesting overtaking maneuver by the truck. Yeah, but here, good on the brakes, also good reaction from the steering. You don't have to turn the steering wheel that much, actually. And what's also really cool here, one click on the assistance systems, I can easily click there, lane assist is deactivated, and also this EU speed warning, oh, I deactivated it in advance even. No. <laughs> <laughs> no one has seen that. So it's really good when you're annoyed by some systems, they need to be on always at start of the vehicle now by you know, uh, just mandatory from the law. So the manufacturers, the only thing they can do is make it easy for you to deactivate them. And that's exactly what they did here. So I think hats off to VW that they, am I just praising VW for something they have done on the software side? That's a premiere. <laughs> so yeah, usually it's always that they have great chassis, great suspension and so on, but they were lacking behind in software. And now they are also picking up with the software things and finding good customer oriented solutions for the software like here with the um, deactivating of the assistance systems so that is actually a good thing to test also while driving that you know that it's actually easily uh, handleable what i also feel on the motorway so the acoustic windscreen in the front is standard this one here by the way also the one with the heating foil and i don't see any i, I don't see any heating foil you know there are two solutions there are these you know, like the, the individual heating lines in there, the old technology. I always see them, it's like, I can't drive that way. Some can, some not. And then this is like this integrated foil, and it looks like there would be nothing. Still, it's a heated front windscreen. The only problem would be if you have polarized glasses on, then you can see some reflect. I think it's still manageable, it still works, um, but that's the only thing you could maybe see some, you know, I don't know, I haven't seen it myself yet. Did you? Maybe? I don't know. Oh, now we can drive 130. Let's see, 110 to 130. Oh, I need to get off the motorway actually. But you see also um, good on the brakes as well. Nice to put the turning indicator in. Yeah, so it's actually good reaction also from the drivetrain, from the brakes and so on. Overall good feeling. And that was like you know, always like more than one kilometers now, more than 60 miles now, and the noise insulation is really very good here. So the set the front windscreen is, yeah, we have a beeper. Front windscreen is standard insulated, and this one here is also equipped with the optional insulating pack. So that means then that the side mirrors, back, um, not side mirrors, the side windows, front and the back also have dual insulation and we felt that it's really very silent in here 
definitely more sound than the previous generation. Then the better aerodynamics um, that also uh, you know come come together. So that is um, yeah, that is really good, especially for longer motorway trips. Super sound in here. The whole vehicle feels from driving actually really premium. It feels like a premium ride. I love that. Um, what I really want to test probably the most exciting thing because we have the new DCC here. So when we go here to the individual settings, now set read to the most comfortable DCC sitting. So just feel how you know, the individual waves are being evened out. It feels really soft. I mean, it's also a quite good road, but you know, there's some waves in there. But that, that feels really elaborated, like, you know, more upmarket segment. Now let's put to the sportiest setting. Uh, yeah, the touch by driving. Let's go here. Wow, that's notable. Now you've, you know, you, you feel like these individual bumps in the road way more clearly. That's interesting. Wow. I mean, now, of course, we have a little bit sport air feedback. <laughs> yeah. So here, sport air feedback then. <laughs> we go a little bit slalom alike. But now let's do the slalom again with the most comfortable setting. I mean, the slalom region is actually quite good in both cases. Hmm. So I wouldn't say when... Let's do here again. What do you say? Yeah, in slalom reaction, it yeah, doesn't yeah, doesn't differ yeah. that much. It's more really when you're running over the bumps. Yeah. That's just like bumpier in the sportier setting, but you have a little bit more feedback from the road. But actually, I would drive with the most comfortable setting, honestly, because the car doesn't feel unsporty from suspension here. It doesn't lean too much in the corners. But then again, it's such a smooth ride. So my tip here definitely would be individual mode, steering to sport and the DCC all the way to comfort and then you have a great driving setting here actually. Now the plug-in hybrid and I try to do an acceleration electric only. Let's see if I can manage. Well that was 0 to 50. It could be a little bit quicker but I want to be gentle because when I use the pin down then also the combustion engine goes on. But you can see, you can even accelerate quite quickly, all electric. And this is also the focus of this new plug-in hybrid, that it's more electric than before. Not only with the higher range, the bigger battery and so on. So realistic range around 80 kilometers, always depending on your driving profile from this 20 kilowatt hours net battery. But also in general, smoother and just more silent and less combustion engine. For example, before when I go here to the S-shifting mode, usually the combustion engine would hop on, but that's not the case here anymore. And also when you select the driving profile here from comfort to sport, it also doesn't go on. So before the engine went on, now it doesn't do that only when you really apply the power. And we can also compare that. So for example, here in the comfort mode, let's see when we hit the throttle, there we go, it's on. But here in the sport mode, the thing is that, there we go, we have more response from the engine as well. And you might always wonder, hmm, isn't it bad for the engine when it suddenly hops on at a high RPM? Of course, it's always better not to do that in a way, but sometimes it's you know maybe needed. So I asked the VW experts, what do they actually do as a countermeasure? First of all, like the coating from the inside of the cylinder is a different one. It's a yeah, more elaborate, stronger one that helps against you know, possible bad effects on the engine. And also, if the engine is not running, at some point they use then you know, a little bit of oil that's running through the engine to just you know, to give it enough fluid that it doesn't run dry, that you don't have bad effects on the engines then in that respect. So there are some countermeasures as for that, so that you're not get <laughs> a broken plug-in uh, hybrid engine uh, pretty quickly. But I would, you know, I would recommend to yeah, not maybe have the situations frequently and uh, yeah, try to gently push the engine on then. Uh, but at some point maybe it is needed for safety reasons and so on, and at least you know that you can theoretically do that. 
So here also the transitions, they also work on that, that the, you know, all electric driving and then the mixed hybrid driving, you also have smoother transitions in between and you also have better recuperation. So when I hit the brake pedal, this recuperation is also more possible in total than before. And also there the transition is better than before. What's also interesting is that we can change the recuperation levels, but it's not, we don't have like a B mode here. This is still the S mode, which is predominantly then for the hybrid driving when the engine is on. So you need to adjust the recuperation modes then in the infotainment system. Yeah, doing that easily while driving is not, yeah, it's, it's actually a little bit complicated to me at least as for the driver, but we have set here our hotkey. Thank you, Leah. So um, yeah. She's the best recuperation expert. <laughs> so, the, yeah, we have, yeah, yeah, exactly. And then um, Leah can select between low, automatic, and high. So, low, it's like a lift throttle, yes, mainly rolling, you know. So, and then we have automatic or oh. high, we can, whatever. We can start with high. So, when I accelerate and then foot of throttle, there's more recuperation. You can also see that in here. It's not exactly a super strong one pedal driving feeling, but it's notable, definitely. An automatic, which would be the standard setting, is also checking out like the ACC, is there a car in front of me or not? Or also according to the topography changes on the map. That's uh, very interesting. And even more interesting, since they homologated that with the low setting, you can have all of the three modes and then restart the vehicle and you have it in the last mode selected. And that's good because maybe you favor one mode or the other and then you just stay in that mode. Yeah, at some point you have to recharge 11 kilowatt AC, 50 kilowatt DC peak. So that then will take you 25 minutes from 10 to 80% state of charge. That is also massively quicker than it was before. So the whole plug-in hybrid system is more usable. You might wonder why do they employ such a high buffer because when I say 20 kilowatt hours net and maybe you read on you know some spec sheets like 25 26 kilowatt hours that's the gross figure and they have such a high buffer that they can maintain the same value for you as a customer for the whole lifetime of the vehicle the battery does lose some capacity over time yeah but not like the whole buffer in a couple of years you know that's but I think it would still be better that you offer more from the start. Maybe then you lose a little bit um, over, over a couple of years, but then I had more before. So, um, yeah, but that's definitely a, like a strategy thing they decided. If you use both powertrains at the same time, you know, like here in sport mode, when you push it on, you can even have a better acceleration. Let's go. Ooh. Oh, that's 80. Hmm, that went quick. So, because the plug-in hybrid drivetrain here will be the second quickest in the lineup, quickest with around six seconds in the acceleration figure, will be the 2 liter TSI with 265 horsepower on all-wheel drive. This one here, front-wheel drive only. You maybe also heard and felt that we had some wheel spin in the front, so much power just in the front axle. Now the pure petrol engine, 1.5 TSI, let's go. Plop, that's 80. Little bit downhill though. Hmm, I mean, acoustic wise, the coolest <laughs> I feel. Have the pure petrol engine sound. Of course, it's in a way that also the slowest of the ones in the test today, but it doesn't feel like that. So, yeah, and you have a quite natural feeling to that engine here. Weight wise, if you ask yourself, hey, the plug in hybrid, is it much heavier? It's about 250 kilograms, so there are like 500 pounds difference. This is not that you would extremely feel that in most situations. So at the same time here, the TSI is the lightest and it kind of also feels light in a way, but not that the plug-in hybrid, you would say, hey, you know, this is heavy and this feels completely different in the handling. In the handling, they are all really good, really good indeed. We have to see if, you know, also reliability and software and like electronics um, keeps up to that, uh, that level. I cannot promise that, but from suspension that is really great and how the car feels as you know as a whole just you know two days earlier we've been driving the Peugeot 3008 which is the exact competitor also 
We have driven in the all-electric version, though, so can't one-to-one -one compare it. It's also uh, available with the comparable engine, though, and we have to say we both experienced that. Talk to Leo about that, too, that this one here, the Tiguan, is maybe more conservative in the interior, styling-wise and so on, but it feels so much more elaborated because of that great suspension and the steering feel and so on. This is something where, where it really, really shines, especially with the DCC, now called DCC Pro, so I can really recommend to go for the adaptive suspension. Maybe not all the other bells and whistles, but the suspension is really something you, you should go for. Engine or the drivetrain is always a combination of entry price and the usage. Taxation reasons might push a lot for the plug-in hybrid. Yeah, that's probably also then a good choice if you can save a lot of money, especially with the company car. For most private use, then here the 1.5 TSI might just be um, a good pick. And also consumption-wise, well, you can also score some good values around 6 liters, more kilometers, like 40 mbg US, 50 mbg UK, in really good ideal conditions using that MHEF smart hybrid drive system. If you have some more dynamic driving, rather towards 7.5 liters in one kilometers, like 30 mbg US, 40 mbg UK, this would also then the latter autos count for the TDI in the all-wheel drive spec because that also consumes some more fuel. So there you see that TDI and TSI come very close. Only when you go like really high-speed motorway, then the TDI can catch up and is very good in the consumption, relatively low. Whereas the petrol engine has a wider span of consumption, so the TDI doesn't vary so much in the consumption. That's the thing. And the plug-in hybrid drive, then you can only always say. It depends how much electric driving and how much petrol driving you do for that hybrid drivetrain. Join me on a tour of the all-new Škoda Kodiak here, the all-new generation with Thomas and Fuel in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with the front that still looks kind of rugged, actually, and I think it's very interesting. They managed to keep up the look of the Kodiak, although reducing the CD value from 0.33 2.28 so lower is definitely better and it's a huge step for example this will mean better fuel economy this color here is called bronze gold but not bronze as in the metal but bronx new york actually and i think yeah at least i found some matching clothes to that didn't i here the front grille really massive rugged style and you can optionally get this lighting this illumination in the middle of the grille it runs through the headlamp unit, optional matrix LED. You can also see it right here with this Czech craftsmanship design on the inside. And then you also get these special turning indicators, for example. Lower part, some honeycomb design. And it's very interesting that we will still offer it five-seater or seven-seater. That's also a difference to the normal EU Tiguan, for example. So the question is, is it still one of the best price performance SUVs? 4 meters 76 or 187 inches is the length of the all-new Škoda Kodiak. This is actually about 6 centimeters or 2 inches longer than before. Wheelbase stays the same. And this one here is actually then around 22 centimeters or 8 inches longer than the EU Tiguan. Also with a little bit more wheelbase than the Tiguan. You can see the side profile is not too drastic in the change. However, the most drastic change is here, black area, and then this silver contrast around the C pillar. Then wheels from 17 to 20 inch. These here are the 19 inch wheels in this rather closed inlet design. Here, by the way, you can see the classic crossover wheel arches in this just plain black plastic style. However, there will also be the Sport line available once again. That one then comes with painted wheel arches in the vehicle color, also with the Sport suspension. 19-inch wheels are also standard there and so on. About suspension, by the way, in general, you have a base suspension, sport suspension and you can go for the DCC Pro that is an upgraded dynamic chassis control the adaptive suspension like in the Passat or also in the Tiguan and that one now works with a two valve system supposed to bring you more sportiness and more comfort at the very same time of course we will keep you updated then when we do a driving review very soon for you Towards the rear, a completely new tail lamp design here, really sculptural once again, and now space for a huge Skoda lettering, so no logo, but the rather big lettering there, and 
success for the autocofuel fake exhaust police because there are no fake exhausts here anymore. And in this trim here, you can see you also have the cascading turning indicator or hazard light at the rear that looks fancy. Now to the interior, car key here is this high gloss black thing, same as for VW, not my favorite one, but door closing sound, let's check it. It's very solid. You might have heard there's this additional sound coming, that's from here, from this door sill pro protector. It's a very cool idea, it automatically goes in and out. We know it already from Škoda from previous generations and other vehicles, Ford is also employing that. It's really against like small parking, you know, uh, incidents, you know, when you hit the door or someone else hits it. I think it's a very cool idea. Then, inside of the doors, this new decor element insert here and this um, decor at least. There are different ones, ones available. This is actually quite cool. Ambient lighting integration. And then the door handle goes up to the upper part. It's also interesting. Here you can control the levers and so on. Looks like good quality. In the low part, this one here, however, is just hard pack. Here you open the rear hatch. Then the all new interior. Once again, this very interesting decor element. Open spoke steering design. Doesn't look too different from the normal, usual ones here now. Then you still have real buttons and lever at the steering wheel here for the steering wheel heating, for example, and you can control the digital instruments with that, for example, so that's also a good move. As for the seats, these ones here are the optional animal skin equipment in the high trim, but you get in loft fabric seats, in lounge microfiber seats, or also the sport line will be available. These ones then also come with microfiber and they will have the integrated head restraint as sport air styling. Of course, we will keep you updated with all, with all the trims later on. Um, yeah, but definitely in this new generation, I would expect that also the high trim comes like with a high grade leather red or something. Steering wheel here. When you look at it, yeah, this open spoke design is something special. It's kind of unique for Skoda, definitely. Here, the manual control in and out, up and down, and headroom. Still a lot of lot left here with 189 or six for two. The general ergonomics of the seats is good, and you have a good roundabout view and so on. There, you can see this more classic design approach on the exterior goes also well with good visibility on the interior. Once again, for all who dream of Rolls Royce, but don't want to afford one because it doesn't make sense, then you can also just as well live here with the Škoda umbrellas. And yeah, I'm totally fine with that. Interior cockpit overview, all new, looks quite fancy at first. Does remind us a little bit maybe of Land Rover, Range Rover. I'll soon also show you why. I found very interesting here that the design here, look at that, goes up here and then it goes down there and kind of like mirrors the design up and down. That's cool. So definitely looks more premium, more exclusive. The screens either starts 10 inch or the bigger one here, 13 inch. And on the left side, digital instruments in 10.25 inch. Soon more deals to that. You still have shifting pedals here, combustion engine version also. And the shifting lever has moved up here. This was inspired originally by the VW ID model. So here forward for drive and press right for the park, backwards like this for the reverse. Dashboard, by the way, structured and also soft touch. That's good. Yes, a proper temperature unit here. The knurling around, awesome here to control the temperature. Easy, it looks pretty cool on the inside as well. When I press this one, seat heating, press another time, seat cooling, press another time, back to the temperature. So that's, oh, it's getting hot in here. So take our oil close. So then we go back to the temperature. And here in the middle part, that would be my favorite thing. They can control the vent strength. And this one you can also switch. And this is definitely inspired by Land Rover or Range Rover. We had that system there before. Here you switch to the volume. Then one more time, here you can control driving modes actually. That's also interesting. And here this is then that you zoom in and out on the map. So very interesting. You can set your favorite control, but is it maybe too much functions on one button. Uh, tell me what you think. Middle console here, slide this one open, slide this one open. Then you have some storage here underneath, two inductive charging pads. And I feel, and I can see like slightly, there are some cooling holes as well. Then this one here is particularly interesting. Zoom out of that. But let me just finish here the cup holes. They seem to be really small actually. So just for thin bottles. Here maybe bigger ones, but or really large ones, for example. And then we can put this one open and then we have more space underneath. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the all-new Skoda Screen Wiper. <laughs> you take it out like this, and then there's an integrated sprayer. And then um, you can use the microfiber sides of this one and yeah, swipe all the way the screen. But you see, yeah, and, um, maybe it was a little bit too much here in the in the lower part. Yeah, but you see, um, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work. Maybe spray a little bit more in the top. Sorry about that. Uh, I need to practice first a little bit, but I think it's a very interesting idea, isn't it? Taking a look at the screen and the infotainment, here there's the camera view, here also with the surround camera. Then you have this main menu and either with these uh, screen savers, that's possible. You also have in the lower part still a hotkey to shut everything off or to activate it again. Here then either map directly or can, you can also make that larger here for the whole screen. Actually looks quite decent as for the speed. Then you have the hotkeys in the lower part here for the phone connection or directly to the GPS again. And of course also Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, both available wired or wireless. Digital instruments always in this 10.25 inch and then you can also change the view what you prefer. Oh, you can also get an optional head-up display. Rear doors, this one here is hard packed but it has a structure and the easy mechanism here, the manual shade and you can see here, that is nice, it covers really all the way, all this area, that's a good thing and especially for kids in the back. And a nice ambient light integration also with some more special structuring here, also playful design detail for the door handle. And then, as for the space, that's of course even more important. When I'm driving as a tall person here, really a lot of leg room left. Here you can also see that this one here has 11 centimeters or 4 inches more wheelbase than the VW Tiguan, the EU version. The Tyron or US Tiguan will also be somewhat different. And here the headroom, still enough. This one equipped here with the panoramic roof. You can actually even still open that one. And here, the rear seats, you could also slide them like this. This would be more trunk length then, but we'll do the measures all the way back here. But this is like really massive how we can move it up and up and down. And then you can also here change the angle of the seating, make it more upright when you uh, this, uh, this, this one. And here, this is like the more, you know, relaxed position here actually. So really very, very well usable. And here in the middle part, you have this, I mean, you can also take this whole console out, so then it would be just a normal felt middle tunnel here. But you can also leave that one in in place. Then you have more cup holders here, actually, two USB-C chargers and separate climate unit next to even seat heating in the rear. Of course, that is an option. By the way, have you noticed it's the ambient lighting? But as soon as I open a door, it turns to red. It's like an additional warning thing or safety thing so i think it's a very nice idea as for the trunk or the boot 910 liters up to 2105 this is what the kodiak has always been famous for this one here the five seater version if you would have the seven seater you would need to deduct about 70 liters here underneath some more space and also replacement tire and here the width is about a meter or 40 inches here between the wheel arches and also the length is about a meter or 40 inches. And then you can release the seats right here on the right side. Same also goes for the left side. And then they go like this and you have to go around and really push them flat like this. This is like a protection lip here or that covers this gap underneath. And then actually we can measure the full length <laughs> up to the front seat. And this here is it's actually quite substantial. It's like 119 meters or 75 inches. And then if that's not enough, then there's also the towing hook. Here, this is the release button. Then underneath, there it goes. It's semi-automatic like this. And you have to unleash it, or unleash it again here and then push it back. As for engines, 1.5 TSI, mild hybrid. Then the 2 liter TSI petrol or this one here the 2 liter TDI different horsepower specs you will find them in the comment or in the video description the full engine list biggest news is a plug-in hybrid with a net battery size of 20 kilowatt hours based on the 1.5 TSI approximately a realistic range electric 80 kilometers or 50 miles something like that and also quick recharging 11 kilowatt AC or 50 kilowatt DC this video is about the all-new Peugeot 3008. It will come as pure petrol. 
on some markets, plug-in hybrid, and also here, especially at the E3008, the pure electric version. And a very special thing is happening here because so far only the big premium manufacturers say, hey, we put a 100 kilowatt hour battery in a vehicle that has a great range and so on. Now also a non-premium manufacturer says, hey, we also just put a large battery in a vehicle that is still in a compact size, compact SUV. Let's see how that turns out. With Thomas Nautical in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go with the front, all new 3008. Very interesting with this dot structure, large at the outside, smaller than to the inside. And it appears as this very interesting grid, depending on the angle you're checking it out from. And here the headlamps, which come as matrix LED pixel light in the GT trim as standard, otherwise an option. And they are kind of in lengthened here by this daytime running light in this Peugeot claw design, like <laughs> Well, the, the exterior dimensions, it's a compact SUV, and we can see it here also in the side profile. But in this new generation, what's even more interesting is here, that you have this coupe shape. So, wow, that's a very expressive design here towards the rear. The length is four meters 54 or 179 inches. That's around nine centimeters or five inches longer than the predecessor. You either get 19 inch wheels or here in this GT trim, 20 inch. Have you seen that? Look at the front and in the rear. So I think the problem with this wheel design is that in the workshop, you would need to actually mount them in the way that they are both like this or both like this or like this. But here it's like, you know, yeah. Or look at that at the other vehicle. So also when it, you know, starts spinning, for example, then it looks kind of odd that the wheels don't move symmetrical, you know what I mean? Yeah, but maybe that's just my problem. <laughs> I don't know. You see here at the other sides, this is parallel at the moment from the wheels. Yeah, however, it doesn't make any sense, of course, to fix it in a workshop because the wheels will turn at a different speed at some point anyway, because of the differential, be it alone you are in the corner. If the wheels would be turning in the same speed, you would have a differential lock, like with off-road vehicles and so on. So yeah, no use. I think it's just design flaw. It looks cool, the wheel, but together with different, you know, yeah, I'm more a friend of wheels that ha have like a symmetry in themselves, and then it's no problem when you look rear, front and so on. But definitely, I think design-wise, once again, yeah, I think it's very expressive design that you buy a compact SUV, but still have something special, like the color called Obsession Blue. Ooh, et regardez, c'est fantastique. <laughs> a little bit of French lesson for today. <laughs> Here, look at that. That's beautiful, right? How this claw design is used and for the turning indicators or then here the hazard lights. Yeah, I love these details. Yeah, indeed, this is what I love about this vehicle. That's a compact SUV and not a premium priced SUV and still it is a design object. Also in the rear, look at that. The tail lamps in the signature and then the turning indicators or hazard lights here with a three dot design. Once again, repeating this claw design in the rear. And now we have all six colors on location for you, Auckland and white, especially good contrast here when you have the black wheel arches. Then you've seen it already, the Obsession Blue. To me, the most screaming out color. I just love it. I would definitely go with this one here. Which one would you pick? Still more to come. This one here, Perla Nera, the black color. Of course, when you look through the car registrations, it's usually black, silver and gray most of the time. Yeah. But I'm also a fan of screaming out colors. This one here, Titan Grey. This looks really elegant, definitely. And this is also a very interesting color. Which color would you say this is actually from the, from the base tone? It's called Ingaro. It's actually an Ingaro blue. So it has a blue nuance, but more a light blue nuance. And last but not least, this is Artense Silver. So a more lighter silver color. Tell me in the comments, which one would you go for? Does it frunk or not? <laughs> no, it does not. Yeah, but you think also this platform is using both combustion engine and electric motor. I mean, there would be some space left though. As for the powertrain, you either have front wheel drive or optional also an all wheel drive version. Both front wheel drive versions 
big or small battery are under nine seconds in the acceleration figure. This one here is this cutaway model, always interesting to see. And here you can see this is the cutaway model of the all-wheel drive version. You can see the rear electric motor right here in the rear. And this one has a 6.4 seconds acceleration figure. So once again, either just over six seconds or under nine seconds all-wheel drive or the front-wheel drive. Top speed is 170 kilometers an hour or around 110 miles per hour. And what you can also see in the cutaway model is the battery pack placed in the lower center of the vehicle. The small battery at 73 kilowatt hours gross, around 71 kilowatt hours net, and then the big battery, 98 kilowatt hours gross, it's around 94 kilowatt hours net. So they have a small buffer between the usable and the nominal battery size. Once again, the big battery only front wheel drive, the small battery front wheel drive or all wheel drive. And after we drive the vehicle, we can also tell you more about the concise range. And recharging 11 kilowatt AC or soon to come also 22 kilowatt AC and the DC charging port will be at the 160 kilowatt peak for both batteries. And the so far official figures 20 to 80 percent state of charge around 30 minutes so 10 to 80 percent state of charge will be more than 30 minutes it's not a super bad figure but also not a super quick one this very platform here the first time it is used on this vehicle for the whole corporation later more corporation models will sit on this platform and you can see here in the front hood you could also house a normal combustion engine that's also what's happening you can also have a 1.2 liter three cylinder mild hybrid petrol engine around 10 seconds in the acceleration figure not a really strong one but lower in the entry price it will be around 10,000 euros or 10,000 pounds cheaper than the electric version so around 40,000 something whereas the electric versions will be around 50,000 with the small battery, big battery will be even above that. And there are also rumors about a plug-in hybrid version, depending on the market. They are not sure where to introduce yet at the filming of this video. This is the key fob, the one we know over years, basically, just with the new logo. Door closing sound. Hmm, it's very solid. I like that. And instead of the doors, the top part here in the front is somewhat soft, also structured and even more beautiful, the gray fabric here. This is also where the ambient lighting will appear and also felt coverings at the inside of the doors right here. And this is even more than some of the premium manufacturers nowadays. Seat in the Allure, fabric on the inside, leather on the outside and here the GT microfiber on the inside. Wow, look at that cockpit here with the nice gray fabric. Listen to that. And this floating screen, 21 inch HD. It's really one screen. Here in the middle part, there's a still screen, for example, standard for all GT trims. In the Allure pack, it's included in the UK, in Germany not. A base version would be two times 10 inch, then separated actually. Hotkey bar in the lower part, they kind of interact. And a super small steering wheel, we know that from Peugeot. You have control in height and in and out it does block only the lowest part of the screen so it's kind of okay you can always see the speed here it's placed relatively high so then they say also that you don't need a head-up display and a very nice integration of the ambient lighting all over the cockpit and on the right side you can also toggle it from hotkeys below right side then you have the main standard infotainment unit also when you go to the apple carplay you have this integration and yeah it looks actually quite nice very crisp and a good integration and you can always return to the main menu this is the car internal gps the temperature is controlled right here yeah i always prefer a separate control somewhere yeah but for a screen solution it's quite okay so it stays here with plus and minus in that space yeah and when you hit the middle part, then you get to the extensive climate unit. But then again, plus and minus is here. And the left side is then reserved for the digital instruments. Wow, look at that. Here, even with the small battery, this is the current range prediction. And you can also have the map full screen in the instruments. That's another setting which you can click through like this. And there we go back again. You do that actually from here.
Hey Peugeot. Seat heating on. Oh, that works because otherwise we have to go in the menu and then here select seats and steering wheel and then you can activate the heated steering wheel for example and here the seat heating. Um, this is a little bit weird because you cannot click in there to activate it. You have to activate it here but then in the screen you can put it to lower levels but when it's out you cannot click it again to put it on then you have to click in the lower part again. I'm not sure why this is so complicated. I really like this lower hotkey area. So when you have Apple CarPlay connected, then it automatically appears here, for example. Start, stop. And this is then here the gear selection. And here, yeah, I feel it's cost savings because it's one button for everything. And then it depends on the field you are clicking. It does give you some feedback, however. Hidden underneath here is the inductive charging pad. And in front of that, the drive mode selector. This has nice clicking sounds. Well, I love this floating console design. However, I think design flaw is this. First of all, I mean here, and then you can kind of like open it from here, but that's not meant to be opened from here. Have you seen it, it kind of opened just because I was rattling here? This is the meant to be opening, and then it turns on this side. I mean, and I as a driver have to like, I mean, who thought of this? Um, I have no idea. And then you have the charging underneath. This is to connect your smartphone with the cable, but wireless is also possible as, you, as you've seen for charging only. And also the quality of this whole thing is doubtful. So this is the least favorite part of the interior, I think. Cup holders are adaptive. And once again, what I love is this beautiful gray fabric covering and also this split opening with a lot of space underneath. You can also get this panoramic roof. There is a shade available it's all electric and separate button here I like to have a separate button and to really open it is still not too wide actually but still cool look at the design of the interior from that angle from the side where you can see the curved lines here of this flying display i think that's just a beautiful job how is it to sit in as a tall driver? 189, 6 for 2. Well, here to that party is coming close, but still works. Then a little bit more space than here towards the panoramic roof. Of course, there's a shade available. Yeah, but I think it works for tall adults and also to the view to the front, also to see the speed. That's actually all fine. And the steering wheel, it's somehow creating fun, definitely. What about the rear? Rear door, hard pack in the top part, then the nice gray fabric covering. Well, and as for the space we have, so when I have the seat set to my driving position, I can use this recess here and it directly fits also for tall adults in the rear. Not abundance of space, but think about that this is also in this segment here. It's a relatively short compact SUV if you compare to some of the um, competitors actually. And headroom in the rear also exactly works. Here, this part we can fold down. They are also somewhat adaptive, adaptive here, these cup holders. Below there, 12 volt charging. And here again, we have this mix of a structured microfiber that feels and looks pretty cool together with a high grade leatherette isofix at the outside seats each. Trunk or boot here, opened underneath there. 520 liters up to 1480. Here the width is a good meter of 40 inches. The standard length is about 88 centimeters or 34 inches. And interesting is here is one 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 split. So at the moment it's two split, but you can also individually fold just this part. And if we take this one out, I can show you. This is the low setting here for this cover. You can also take that out completely or move it in the upper setting. In this way you have then this even loading area but less depth underneath there is space for a charging cable easily total length about 116 meters or 64 inches and interesting by the way the towing capacities pure petrol 1200 kilograms 1250 for the front wheel drive electric version like this 1,350 for the all-wheel drive electric version and 1,550 for the plug-in hybrid model that is to come on some markets not yet decided. Acceleration. Plop. 
that was 50 to 100 kilometers an hour. I mean, you always have instant torque with electric vehicles. This one, of course, here, front-wheel drive, and not too spectacular from the power output. As I said earlier, a little bit less than nine seconds in the acceleration figure from zero to one kilometers an hour. But you see here, it's also quick enough to enter the motorway. What's pretty cool here, around run on 10 kilometers an hour now, 65 miles an hour, it is very silent in here. So good noise insulation. Also, we don't hear much tire noise and so on from the road. Maybe at the later stage, we can also do German Autobahn with more high speed or even higher speed. Here, of course, in France and rest of Europe, speeds are always yeah, a little bit restricted in comparison to Germany. We can also set the cruise control here at the steering wheel. It gives me some feedback. And then this is also the adaptive cruise control. So keeping the distance to the car in front of me. And you can also control the distance. And I see everything here then in this display. I mean, it's, it's actually quite good, so I'm not missing a head-up display or something because it's indeed very visible. And also when I'm here in the GPS uh, setting here, um, either you can see it on the right side here, and when there's like a next intersection coming, I would also have a screen here. So even if there's something else here, I can still see where I'm going as a driver or maybe when the, when the passenger or something um, do stuff something here, I still then have an information on, on the left still. One more press here on the steering wheel, I can activate the drive assist. And now there's this, oh, here the blind spot monitor, it's like a small red dot in the side mirror. And then here, see here the active lane keeping assist. So keeping the car in the lane, a little bit to the left, I would say, but here, no, yeah, actually quite smooth. Is it really centralized? so sure about that but to my feeling it's a little bit more to the left maybe but i think it's overall actually fine the blind spot motor appears quite late that's their philosophy in the former psa now stellantis group that they don't have this blind spot warning in advance but rather in the moment where the car is in the blind spot to me it's most of the time a little bit too late but you can also argue pro and con this philosophy yeah i feel here that the lane keeping assist it's hugging a little bit too much to the left side. So I would feel that there's a lot of space on the right, what do you think? A lot of space on the right side and really close here on, on the left. So um, I mean, the, the lines are pretty even, I would say, but yeah, that's something I, I do notice here, definitely. When we are already at speed, let's say we have this typical overtaking situation. And also here with, you know, the steering feel control, let's see. Plop, that's 110, so that was 90 to 110. And the steering feel is sporty, it feels gaming alike, I would say. It's also direct, you don't have to steer that much. You don't get the most natural feeling from it, but it's overall fun. It also changes a little bit in the driving modes. Here, for example, in the sport mode, I have a little bit more feedback. When I go back to the normal mode, then it's, you know, definitely softer. Um, yeah, feedback is, to me, better in the sport mode, definitely. Also, you have changed throttle input. So in the sport mode, you just get quicker acceleration in the sense of that the throttle pedal is definitely more responsive. Doesn't mean that you have much more horsepower output or something. But this is also a different philosophy from manufacturer to manufacturer. Overall, it feels home on the mo you feel home in, on the motorway here. It's also comfortable here in these sport seats. I feel that the head restraint is sometimes a little bit, you know, doesn't feel as would be high quality when you lean back here and it, it gives away a little bit. But the overall seat is actually fine to me. We have to see also how it is over long distance, actually. And some countryside driving, also topography a little bit up and down. We can talk about recuperation. You can set the levels here with the shifting pedals behind the steering wheel. Material here, by the way, is still animal-based, so they haven't worked on that yet to make that one animal-free. And they're also offering optional animal skin, animal skin seats still, at least only an option. And here then, so at the moment, just little recuperation. I can hit the left pedal one stronger, one more time, then it's even stronger. So you have these three levels. So depending on if you rather want a one pedal driving feeling 
or if you more enjoy to rather roll, have some recuperation like with a normal engine brake, and then do the rest of a recuperation with the brake pedal. You can also see it here in this individualization when you are in this um, energy menu. Yeah, but looking at that while driving is maybe not uh, <laughs> maybe not ideal. How accessible is all that kind of stuff? Well, it's cool that you can slide here in the lower part. So then go to this application drawer, and then you have like this another main menu, which also has a better overview while driving, I would feel. And then there's this energy meter. But you see here, I clicked it, but sometimes it doesn't react. So, and the responsiveness of the system is not ideal, I would say. What is, however, quite cool. So even when you are in this main menu and say like, hey, we have this new law now in Europe that you have a very annoying speed limit warner, even if you exceed just by one kilometer an hour. So far, I haven't heard it that much here in this vehicle. However, if you like to turn it off, you have to always do it on and on again if you restart the vehicle. But here it's actually quite easy. So when you just slide right and then go ADAS, and then here accept the speed warning. There can you, yeah, you have to confirm it then, and then it's actually off. So this would be one way, and the other way, uh, let's see, going just somewhere here, the other way would be pressing the vehicle symbol here, and then you're actually even quicker at that. So that is at least something where they move between the allowed limits and make it more or less easy for the driver to deactivate it. Also while driving this, of course, more or less possible, better to concentrate on the road as always by the way. So uh, a nice visualization for you is definitely here this energy meter where you can see the recuperation happening and so on. I feel the vehicle has enough power and with the recuperation I meanwhile have the best feeling when I have just little recuperation when I'm lifting the throttle pedal. I know for example Tesla does it completely different. They have one pedal driving feeling only and that's it. You can get used to it, but you have to get used to it because it applies so much G-force on your driver, and on your co-driver actually, on the driver as well. So you have to be very gentle with the throttle then. And if you just lift it and have some recuperation, do the rest with the brake pedal, that's fine. With Tesla, the thing is when you use the brake pedal, then the brakes are really being applied. You know, um, At the same time, of course, also the recuperation when you lift the throttle. But here, their philosophy is when you hit the brake pedal, first all the recuperation is being used. And then if you need more power, then also the wheel brakes are being applied. So it is once again a very fun driving feeling here in the Peugeot. They do that with basically all of their models with this joyful gaming setup, I would call it that way. You don't feel most naturally connected to the road, but I think that's fine in a way. If you compare the previous generation, 3008, how different does it feel? I think they do have some similarities. Of course, the screen is, is a large difference. So I think design-wise, you know, both exterior and interior, a large leap. So design-wise, this is yeah, one of my favorite SUVs, I really have to say. Quality-wise, there are some great things also to enjoy. I mean, you are driving and still looking at that and it's really enjoyable. But some of the user interface and some of the very detailed then you see that's not like a super high class premium vehicle then again we have the big battery and still a very good range and we will drive further and further now to get a nice average consumption for you here today we have nice mild temperatures outside today so it's good conditions for the battery so we can expect a good result but how good is the result really and what does it mean for the concise real world range when Leah pointed out, look at that, here after test ride, yep, the wheels are not aligned anymore again, at least on this side. Let's check out, <laughs> let's check out the other side. There we go. That's oh, a beautiful light now. Uh, no, no, not at all. So yeah, that, that proves my point actually that no matter what you do before driving, because the wheels do turn in different directions, uh, I mean, not in different directions, I mean at different speed, yeah, you have no chance. At some point they are misaligned. But yeah, the car itself looks really beautiful in that scenery here, right? And yeah, that's even more beautiful than <laughs> here in southern France. So what could we score today as for the energy economy? 
and then the real world range. We had really ideal conditions for electric vehicles. We didn't have too much motorway, also a lot of lower speeds and so on, city, countryside. And we scored some 15 kilowatt hours on one kilometers, so that's around four miles per kilowatt hour. Very efficient, very good result. It will be a little bit worse when we have like more higher speed motorway, of course. But that would mean with a small battery around 500 kilometers or 300 miles of real world range. And with the bigger battery, it will even be more like, you know, 600 kilometers or 370 miles. So very good results. Of course, I want to repeat that one more time when we, for example, have the car in Germany and can drive motorway at higher speeds, maybe even at lower temperatures and see what we score then. But first results, really promising, although you always have to say, ideal conditions and maybe other EV tests we've done were in worse conditions. So it's always really hard to one-to-one -one compare them, but it definitely shows that this concept works to have a compact SUV, put a relatively large battery in there, already the small battery is relatively large and the larger one will be a little bit more expensive, but it's extremely large considering that size of the vehicle and also that it's not like this 100 or 150,000 euro or dollars, super premium, five meter sedan, whatever. So this approach here will catch a lot of customers. I'm pretty certain of that. So many fancy new cars out there, but what are people really buying? This year, the Toyota RAV4, still one of the best SUV bestsellers. Why is that actually? Let's find out together with Thomas Nautigefühl in 4K full screen, full length. Let's go here with all the details of the current model. And we have it here in a special version, the GR Sport. Wow, what a look here for the RAV4. Not only that it's like this okay, you know, like normal practical car. Now it can also be really sporty. Look at that, this black mesh grill here. Also in the lower part, sporty accentuations. And it works very well with the contrast to the white exterior color. Modern daytime running lights. So I think they got a really nice rugged off-road look here for the RAV4. Usually it starts at 17-inch wheels. These ones here are 18-inch winter tires, but you can also get usually 19-inch then for the GR Sport model. Turning indicators in the front, pretty tiny, however, still fancy. And because they have this element underneath, it shines into that. And then again, I think the size is okay. Interesting, isn't it? Turning indicators in the rear, not so fancy. However, it's a nice signature here with the running light. And overall, the rear design is pretty cool. Here, special in the GR Sport. Look at that black contrast. And then we have this silver one right here. Once again, this mesh grill and no fake exhaust at all. So I really like it also from this rugged, clean rear design. 4 meters 60 or 181 inches is the length of the RAV4. Just right in that segment where it's not too big, but not too small the VW Tiguan or the Hyundai Tucson or the Honda CRV would be typical competitors. Here the GR Sport gets the black contrasting roof that fits the vehicle also pretty well and another black contrast in the lower part here and as I said you can also get bigger wheels if you then stick with the summer tires for example. This is the key fob, simple and then you might think Oh, wait a minute, this is the remote for the independent heating or something. No, it's not. This one is an additional security token because even burglars love the RAV4. The Lexus RX and the Toyota RAV4 are among the most stolen vehicles in Europe. And that's why they have this additional security token. You cannot start the vehicle without it. It's a good thing that they do something against it because also insurance costs are rising for these vehicles. Yeah, but on the other hand, it's kind of like, you know, clunky then a little bit here in the pocket. Yeah, but um, you see, people love that vehicle, obviously also because of the reliability and so on. The RAV4 is a very reliable car. Rankings have more and more shown that. Then the door closing sound is not that special. That's nothing where Toyota pays special attention to. But here on the inside of the doors, nice leatherette covering. You can really see how, how it's also soft underneath. I really like that. Simple, however, more the you know, like equipment here for the doors and so on and hard pack in the lower part. Also no covering here from the inside. Then GR Sport steering wheel, special with it version. Also contrast stitches on the inside, real buttons at the steering wheel. New digital instruments with this update here now. And these GR Sport seats have microfiber on the inside. That's pretty fancy. Other than that, you also get fabric or leatherette then for the RAV4, depending on the market situation. And 
It's really nice from the comfort, also from the ergonomics and enough space with 189 or 6 foot 2. Really good also for tall adults. That's also why people appreciate the RAV4. It's comfortable, it's simple, straightforward. You exactly know what you're doing. Steering wheel, by the way, easily up and down, in and out. Manual control. Then we have a good view to these new digital instruments. They also switch according to the driving modes. Then that looks pretty fancy, doesn't it? We also have a head-up display that's project into the windshield and then when we take a look at the overview here with the soft touch leatherette also soft touch on this top part Ooh, and i love this here this manual climate unit it's really large you can control it just while driving blindfolded that's actually cool and also here the vent strength everything easy and straightforward also here the seat heating nice switch and also from the acoustic feedback that's how it's supposed to be new updated 10.5 inch infotainment system this is here the apple carplay integration also works wireless and with auto is also available and then here this is then the normal main menu here you can for example see the energy flow but they kept it actually pretty simple that mainly people will use here the hotkey for the carplay or the android auto integration but you still have a manual volume jog here and that's a good feedback also, so everything I need. Passenger side, there's a nice structure here on the inside of this cubby hole. Then the glove box is actually also dampened. That's nice. And then the middle console. I really like this large off-road or like shifting lever. Why not? And then you also have the drive mode selector. Push for normal, right side for sport mode, for example. It also gives a nice feedback. So, yeah, pretty cool. And here, this then the trail button to set everything for off-road driving. In the front, you have inductive charging pad, which you can activate or deactivate. USB-A charger. The cup holes are really deeply in there. And then they're also adaptive. But everything is actually very well built here. Then the leather red cover for this one. This one could be a little bit more fixed, I would say. Underneath, even more of that off-road light structure and underneath more space and two USB-C chargers. The rear mirror can also be flipped and then you have the rear camera mirror when everything in the rear is maybe fully packed. Rear seating, here the rear doors. Oh, there's a nice leatherette cover also on the top part here. So I like that build quality. Hardback just in the lower part. This trim here even has seat heating for the rear seats. Wow. Then also the nice microfiber insides on the rear seats. You can, by the way, put these rear bench here a little bit, you know, a little bit more upright like this. Then you have more trunk or sit more upright, and then you can put it in a more laid back position. The middle seat here is also usable, so it is actually suitable for five tall adults. And here, the rear leg room also fits then to the front seats. Headroom like this with 189 or 6 foot 2, very comfortable indeed, and a lot of space. So that's also one of the reasons why it's so, you know, so popular. Just not adaptive here these cup holders but I think we can live with that the thing that is counting is the space and also really a good comfort two USB C chargers by the way now at the rear middle console trunk or boot here with the electric hatch around 520 liters and let's see what's really special is the width here this is like 120 in meters or 47 inches that's really impressive and there's still same here just a little bit narrower here this is this rugged all-weather mat you don't have to go for it it's a fabric underneath and here space for the charging cable if you have done the plug-in hybrid version and the normal length like 95 centimeters or 37 inches so very well usable trunk to fold the seats you can reach over like this or then go around so both is actually possible. Engines, 2.5 liter four cylinder, non-hybrid, like a North American market, then the hybrid, which is all over the place actually in all markets, front wheel drive or all wheel drive, and then the plug-in hybrid version, also called Prime in the North American market, over 300 horsepower then, system output, rear electric motor to give you that all-wheel drive then in this case in six seconds in the acceleration figure that's two to two and a half seconds quicker than the other version sense for the normal inbuilt hybrid we'll also see if that makes sense the net battery capacity here is about 14.5 kilowatt hours so you will get some 60 70 kilometers of daily real world range so around 30 40 miles charging flat by the way is mm, yeah 
not so cool, I would say. 6.6 .6 kilowatts, so also not too quick. Yeah, but then again, it's also not a really large battery. You really have to think about if the plug-in hybrid makes sense. It rather makes sense in markets where there are governmental subsidies and so on. Other than that, the built-in hybrid will also be very efficient. Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Toyota RAV4 Prime or plug-in hybrid. But everything I say will count for the hybrid and for the plug-in hybrid version with some specifics here about the plug-in hybrid. So pure electric is 135 kilometers an hour, like 83 miles an hour. Then you can drive just on the electric mode here. The battery is, of course, bigger than with the inbuilt hybrid. But what is even more interesting is when I have it here kind of depleted, there's still, you know, is always like a buffer. And so even when I go to sports mode now and we do the acceleration, let's see if we, stand, if we can still get the whole boost. So here we'll start from 50 kilometers an hour and accelerate it out. Safety first. Let's go. Plop, that's 100. 120. Yeah, I mean, of course, it doesn't sound that great when you don't have like a real gearbox with different gears and so on. But it's surprisingly powerful here for a Toyota because they usually don't focus on good acceleration. But here this plug-in hybrid version still gives you that power from that buffer. I mean, in most situations you will have more like the full power still, even if you haven't freshly recharged, because it keeps this buffer unless you do like you know like really some very extreme brake acceleration brake acceleration like you know then maybe not you know so but in most cases it's still there and it's actually fine and I have tested it now for quite a while and I have to say with some plug-in hybrids they don't really work like the inbuilt hybrids when the battery is depleted and you have quite high fuel consumption but here it does work so you can score some similar fuel economy somewhat like five or even a little bit less than five liters on 100 kilometers so that's a good 50 mpg us or even some 60 mpg uk and that's of course amazing for a car at that size really well done and that also counts for the inbuilt hybrid because you can use it in the very same way so when i lift my foot off the throttle then it depends on you know what's the status of the engine and how much electric consumers are on the inside. You also have this energy meter where you can check it out. So sometimes when you lift your foot of the throttle directly, the EV mode goes on, sometimes not. It really depends then. And you can also induce it here with the EV mode or you can also put the battery hold mode to recharge the battery while driving. But that's not really an efficient thing to do. Best is actually to leave the vehicle in the auto mode and let the vehicle do its thing. Here now at 120 kilometers an hour, so like 70 miles an hour, let's do the lane change here. Suspension is a good, good setting actually. So it, it is not unsporty, it's not uncomfortable. I think they found exactly the right spot here equipped with 18 inch winter tires. If you would have the 19 inch summer tires here for the GR Sport, of course the ride would be a little bit stiffer. But it feels good here on the German Autobahn. The only thing and, you know, since we test a lot of German cars here, you're always asking me, like, what is then the difference when I get the Toyota, for example? Yeah, it's not that silent on the motorway at higher speeds. So they don't pay the biggest attention to the noise insulation. And then again, they score better reliability figures, you know. So from the comfort, the seats are actually quite nice. Also with the microfiber insert here in the GS Sport. They hold you tight, yet at the same time, they give you good comfort. I can very well imagine long mileage in this vehicle. The only thing that is somewhat annoying is when you're driving a little bit faster, then it's kind of noisy here, that, um, that I have to say. And of course, you know, even though the suspension is fine and the steering is also fine, so there's not a dead zone area, precise commands on the road, but the overall feeling of this vehicle, especially at higher speeds, uh, when you then do a lane change, it's not that it would be much fun to drive, you know? So the agility and driving dynamics from the Germans, that is what they do better also in this segment here. 
now let's put it to even more speed let's see if we can score top speed here as well it's a little bit windy outside today um, but nevertheless yeah getting quite noisy now 180 is like 185 186 you know on the brakes then recuperation is setting in yeah and the sound from the engine is of course not the most pleasant one but still you feel very controlled and safe in that vehicle here you know lift my foot off the throttle and I'm in the EV mode so engine is not running and also the transitions here between the motorways here when I steer it now I have a good steering feeling but it's not exactly fun to do it here you know it's not bad I still enjoy driving it because I love driving cars but this vehicle doesn't give you this fun agility feeling you know uh, that is also not the focus of this vehicle you just have to have to know that you know, so even though it promises here GR Sport and so on, that's more the, the visual part. Yes, the suspension is a little bit stiffer in the setup here in the GR Sport, that is true. However, I don't feel that it would make a big difference. And also when you're driving over some bumps or so on, it's not unpleasant or so. So that's actually fine from that setup. Yeah, here you now when accelerating, it always sounds like the engine is a little bit struggling but it also has to do with the transmission <laughs> setup here we go Another lane change here yeah i think I, you i would rather enjoy driving some slower speeds and just enjoying the fuel economy which is really great and not racing this car out basically by the way if we switch back to the normal one we just push it here and then again lifting my foot of the throttle it's also different visualization here in this case then not the EV mode is on a little bit too quick so it always depends then the electric moments you rather use in the city actually so for example here lift my foot over the throttle EV mode when I'm at lower speeds or like city traffic and so on then you're often driving in the EV mode even though when you use the plug-in hybrid with the de almost depleted battery and use it like the inbuilt hybrid most of the time in the city you are driving EV. So when I was doing some, you know, city driving and so on, and there is this meter also in the instruments that tells you how, how is the percentage of the EV driving. And at this moment with motorway, it's like, even then it's like one quarter of EV driving, even, you know, higher speed motorway, because sometimes you go over the throttle and so on. But in city traffic only, I had figures like three quarters of the time, like 75% of the time, I was driving pure electric. And that's, of course, amazing. If you can recharge, that will, of course, make sense when you have the plug-in hybrid. Then, of course, you have, yeah, 100% if you like. That always depends then on your driving profile and how and where you can recharge. But why is it so popular? Great fuel economy, especially then in the hybrid versions. Good price-performance ratio. It drives very well. Yes, it's not the most engaging drive, but it's also very reliable and has so much space here. Yeah, these are all the reasons why it's still one of the best sellers. The front camera has a very good resolution and also different angles, actually. Here in this view, for example, is wide angle, but it looks more down. That you can really see what's going on here. So I really have to go down here all the way throughout. And I'm very, very close to the camera here, by the way. So uh, probably closer than expected, right? <laughs> the Mazda CX-5 is still a very popular compact SUV. And now it comes as a facelift here with Thomas and Autogefühl. Show you all the details. The front grille has a new design, a little bit more rectangular, stronger, wider and also with this new structure on the inside here in a special sporty trim which is very interesting indeed and also new led lamps here in the front optional with a matrix led which now also features even more single leds and here we see an interesting comparison here in the front with the chrome and also the lower parts a little bit different everything in black right here also the lower bumper and this additional red decor small element on the other side 4 meters 58 or 181 inches is the length of the cx5 changes they did some you know chassis optimizations and also noise dampening we see in the driving part if that works and here's very interesting you can see 19 inch wheels the biggest one available starts at 17 on both vehicles we have here but you can see here with painted wheel arches in vehicle color this one is called soul crystal red or 
for example, the German mar uh, market, it's called Magma Red. Magma in the market, yeah. <laughs> and then here we have black wheels and black painted accentuations around the wheel arches. Gives a more sinister look also here with the black contrast and the side mirrors. So overall, a very nice and sporty look. This one, of course, even sportier. Which one would you go for, actually? In the rear, news here with new LED signature. So from LED technology and also different signature, pretty modern and cool. And also a new rear bumper. And in this top sports trim, there's also high gloss black around then here. And the facelift also brings a very interesting new color. This is called Circan Sand. Maybe a little bit military camo style or something. It is indeed daring, but yeah, why not? what do you think? Tell me in the comments. As engines, in some markets you still get the 2.2 liter diesel, and that main engines either the 2 liter petrol engine, Forslin, or the 2.5 liter one. We have it here today, around 200 horsepower. All wheel drive is also available. And in the US, you also get this one here turbocharged then with 50 horsepower more. This is the car key. That is not that premium like. So, dog closing sound. That's actually quite good. And you can see also here how the doors are aligned. It's actually a good build quality. Of course, Mazda does not want to be premium in the first place, but they have increased the build quality over the years massively indeed. You can also see soft touch here, contour stitches. You have also like a sporty insert right here. And you can see here there's also the sports line on the interior, also with red stitches or red stitching here on the inside of the steering wheel. Still normal buttons at the steering wheel, that's good. Better than hashtag capacitive BS for sure. As for seats, this is here animal skin in this case, but you can get in the UK, in Germany, a black leatherette that looks almost the same. In the UK, you can also get a beige leatherette. And the base would be just fabric seats anyway. And now with the so-called new ground trim level, not available in all markets, you can also get a microfiber on the inside and leatherette on the outside. That looks pretty spectacular, doesn't it? Getting on the inside, compact SUV style, and you already have an upright seating position. Is a very good, let's say, standard vehicle in a, in a way that you can do a lot with it. It's not too long, it's not too short. Tall people already feel at home and headroom massive with 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1. And another short look at this new ground special edition model. It's very really interesting, these neon green accentuations, for example. They are also quite daring. Not sure if this is necessary, also here around the seat. Um, maybe just in gray would have been more suitable for everyone. But the cool thing about this seat here, that the first time we see here a microfiber seat then um, for the CX-5, and the outside then is also leatherette. So that's of course pretty cool. So a very high class animal free seat. And what about the comfort? Let's see. Yeah, I mean, the, the same base ergonomics, which are actually good. And yeah, the microfiber actually makes it also quite cozy. So I would like this seat, but maybe more in a subtle nuance that, for example, the contrast I'm gray. That would be really cool. Also, tell me in the comments what you think about this. Straightforward interior, 10.25 inch screen, so more deals with that. Here again, soft touch, this leather red looks actually quite cool. And we still have manual climate dials. So yeah, the car is somewhat conservative, but there are also good things to be conservative in this case here for, uh, for cars, also with metal knurling around. Then we have the automatic gearbox and also there's a new drive selector when you have auto gearbox and all-wheel drive, which we have here. It also now features a special off-road mode, which then, you know, changes something of the stability control and so on. And up there is more in, towards the so-called sport mode. Inductive charging pad is now new here in the front, actually. And then more to the rear, you control the infotainment system from here because this is not a touchscreen. Intentionally, they say. Here, adaptive cup holders, they hold the bottles quite tight. And then you also have a soft surface here for the middle storage. And not sure what I thought about that. So there's a cable for the smartphone, but then you cannot really put it here. But then there's this hole that you can have the smartphone here, but then you put them in the cup holders. Or, um, not sure how they thought, thought about that. Um, yeah, and then there's more space underneath. The front camera has a very good resolution and also different angles, actually. Here in this view, for example, is wide angle, but it looks more down. That you can really see what's going on here. So I really have to go down here all the way throughout. And I'm very, very close to the camera here, by the way. So uh, probably closer than expected, right? <laughs> and then there's a side mirror view so that you can see that don't damage your alloys. You can see here, I can fly into the picture with my hand. 
<laughs> it looks pretty weird then, right? Because of the um, wide angle once again. But really um, helpful, definitely here. You can, you can see that you don't damage your wheels. This is all in this 360 degree camera package. And the rear view camera, this is standard one, you can see has a very good resolution now. And rest of the infotainment said here, Master says no touchscreen due to safety reasons, but they kept it quite simple. So you can also more or less control it than with this thing from below. This is then the map view, for example, actually quite clear, but I mean, like to hover in the map is then not that easy to do it. And also with that lower control stick, for example. Other than that, you also have the Apple CarPlay integration um, and then you can, you know, scroll like that. So yeah, it's okay. And this car is also equipped with the Bose sound system and I have to say, it's quite decent sound indeed. So for music lovers, should go for that one. Instruments, a mix of analog and digital. So the outsides are analog and the inside here, there's a small screen. Then you can see here also when I put the sport mode, it becomes red. And here in the off-road mode, there's more yellowish tone. And you can also get a head-up display, small but useful. If you care about installing child seats, got something for you. Look at that, rear doors almost open 90 degrees. That's really cool. And also build quality wise, really good. So look at that. Soft touch here on the top part already with leatherette and even softer here. So good comfort there also for the rear passengers. And you can see here the basic setup. Let's see how much leg room we have actually. So this is the seat as I would be driving and uh, it comes close indeed. So I do, um, you know, hit the back part here. So not too much leg room. Head room, however, is pretty sufficient. Of course, it's not the longest vehicle. And, but in general, the seating comfort in the rear is actually quite decent. You can also get an electric hatch for the trunk here. Now 522 liters, so it gained a couple of liters actually with that facelift. The length is here at 95 centimeters or 37 inches. And the width, let's see, yeah, that's the standard. A good, yeah, good meter of 40 inches, even a little bit more, even in the lower part and even higher than in the upper part. Easy here with that cabin trolley, of course. Underneath here, let's see, we have some more space, so quite spacious trunk indeed. And then we can fold the seats and that's very interesting. We can do it like this. There's also a single folding just for the ski hatch. And then here we go, the third one. So um, yeah, we have to push it here. And, yeah, it seems like they fixed it here. Last time we had the CX-5, um, it was not that good from the build quality here, but this, not, this transition now is a little bit better, definitely. And the overall length to the front seats we're driving is here at 1 meter 65 or 65 inches. Interesting, by the way, listen to this. So when you just do the startup, that exhaust here from the 2.5 natural aspirated engine Sounds quite kind of sporty, right? You know, with the starter, but when you hit the throttle, yeah, then it doesn't sound that sporty. But in the in the you know in the, in the idle mode, just like this, quite sporty, right? Welcome to Thomas's driving lounge with the Mazda CX-5. That well, it's not a classic vehicle, but you know, but. The, classic model, so to speak. We're not there all around us and evergreens. And we have it here with a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine, the big petrol engine, here with around 200 horsepower without the turbocharger. In the US, that's also the one, the stronger one with the turbocharger available. We have this new drive mode selector here in the middle part, and we can also go to the sports mode, for example. Oh, we have a great road surface here. And let's do one acceleration. We're now at 60 kilometers an hour. We'll just do a short, you know, in-between sprint from 60 to 80. Plop, that's it. Yeah, and you hear this naturally aspirated engine, you know, really going in the RPMs. Now we have to switch the motorway right here. Now we, one further, right? Yeah, one further. Yeah, we're around Barcelona here today and gonna get used. Yeah, it's the first time this year for me actually in Barcelona. We can go back to the normal driving mode right here. It also switches a little bit in the instruments. Sports mode goes red, normal rather has this bright scheme. The CX-5 always good here in the steering, has a very natural steering feeling. So it doesn't feel artificial at all. And it's also very precise. You can see it 
also here in that corner. They have, for this face of here, worked on the noise insulation and also a little bit some, you know, chassis details and so on. And especially now when we have here a very good road surface, you feel it's really more silent than before. So it is not the you know, most astonishing all new vehicle whatsoever. It's not all electric yet and so on. But it does everything very well what it's designed to do for. And here, you know, around 80 kilometers an hour, so like 50 miles an hour, it is very, very silent. So uh, as for the noise insulation, feels really sophisticated and indeed we feel some improvement. Soon we'll also head out to the mountains, have some more winding roads, then we can also check out how it is for the driving and agility and so on. Blind spot monitor is here in the side of mirrors. It's a good feature and when you hit the turning indicator, it's also blinking and also gave this acoustic warning. Sorry if I <laughs> irritated someone now, but yeah, that's for testing purposes, definitely. Here, once again, let me go to the sport mode one, one more time. And then, yeah, it's a nice red color we have here. Then <laughs> we go from 75 kilometers an hour. Let's do another acceleration and let's go. Plop, that's 100. So you see, you can still accelerate on the motorway. It does sound a little bit, yeah, you know, that it would be stressed out. That's the thing when you don't have that turbo. Other than that, when you keep it at low RPMs, it's also reasonably silent. That's the thing with the naturally aspirated engines. There's one less thing that can break. There's no turbo, so it cannot break down. But then again, when you really want that power, when you really need it, you have to hammer the throttle and just work with high revs. So we have to have to go for that. Then you can also get the power out of these engines, definitely. Then lane change here, once again, very good as for the steering feeling. So since you also have the upright seating position, it's still a very good motorway vehicle. And here with the facelift, with the upgraded noise insulation, even a little bit calmer than also on longer journeys. Now some beautiful winding roads. That's the cool thing about Barcelona, by the way. It's of course a very vibrant city, also with a nice beach. But then you can drive out like 10, 15 minutes and you're already in the mountains and have really nice routes. So here, let's go to the sport mode once again. Ooh, red background. And we have, you know, we can test some slalom here. You can see, once again, natural steering feeling. And the car doesn't lean too much. However, suspension has found a good compromise, actually. So it's not too stiff, it's not too soft, delivers you enough comfort without being too soft. I think very good here. Although we also have the big wheels, I've shown you earlier on this vehicle here. It's not that I will say like, you need to have smaller wheels to have um, sufficient comfort or something. Here, when we don't need the acceleration, we can also go to normal mode, just more relaxing to drive. However, if you want more comfort, of course, the smaller wheels will always do a good job because you just have more tire dampening, so to speak. And, well, they did some changes here also to, you know, like not structural changes, but some chassis optimization. And also, you know, they have this G-vectoring control where in, in corners they take away some torque and add some torque at the outside of the, uh, you know, at the outgo outgoing of the corner. So. Little optimizations. Does it feel like a completely different vehicle? No, not at all. Would I realize it when I drive a pre-facelift and a post-facelift that it drives, it drives differently? I mean, the noise insulation, yes, you, um, you do feel that, definitely. But hmm, driving agility-wise, maybe it's a little bit better, but it's not that they can, you know, can really say that it's a huge difference. Well, and our final consumption for the day, around seven and a half liters on one kilometer. So that's about 35 mpg US or around 40 mpg UK. Quite okay for a vehicle with that engine then. One of the most sold SUVs worldwide is still the Honda CRV. Why is that actually? And is it the same or will it be the same in this new generation here? We're going to find out with Thomas Nautigefühl in 4K, full screen, full length. Let's go here with the front and I really have to say, I love it. Not only that it's a nice blue color, but look at that front grille. It looks really strong and almost kind of off-road-ish. 
whereas more and more SUVs go in the very round direction and streamlined, so to speak. This one with a very cool, strong design here, also with the daytime running light integration. So I love it design-wise. That's also one of the main reasons why people still go for the CRV. Here in the side profile, we can see 4 meters 71 or 185 inches. It's about 8 centimeters or 3 inches longer than the predecessor, so a little bit longer than before. Wheels here, in this case, black with 18 inch. You can also get 19 inch wheels. These are in this case then here also winter tires and once again a very upright design more focused on the space on the inside because the second reason why people go for the CRV is it has like an ideal size it's not too big but it's also not too small and it always has a lot of space on the inside so also families go for the CRV here in the rear vertical design of the tail lamps I think is also rather a type wait a minute isn't that don't you see like Volvo, you know, like Volvo XC60. Uh, Michelle also thought that. Yeah, definitely Volvo design in the rear, right? But I mean, in a good way, you know, isn't it? And here in the lower part, oh, oh, oh. <whistles> Auto Gefühl, fake exhaust police here. These are pure fake exhaust. Yeah, I think they could have lived without it. By the way, it here it says CRV AWD, so that's an all-wheel drive version, front, front plus rear on demand, that's the system. And here it says EHEV, so we'll soon talk about the different engines, but there's one difference already here in the rear, I can tell you, it's a towing with the inbuilt hybrid, 750 kilograms of towing. With the plug-in hybrid, it's actually double 1.5 tons. And then again, once again, different for the pure petrol engine that you can get in the US. And you might see that in the front, next to the increased wheelbase, here you can see wider tracks now. And we'll see in the driving part if this also translates into a better drive. So on the Northern American market, you can get a 1.5 liter turbo, so it's like the entry level engine. And here in European market, you only get either here the inbuilt hybrid that works in a very interesting way, three different ways. It can directly power the wheels, the combustion engine. It can drive electric and also the combustion engine can serve as a generator. So uh, three different ways of driving with that one. And then there's also a plug-in hybrid available now, so you can recharge that one externally. The inbuilt hybrid will be the more important engine sales-wise, however. Key fob, nothing special, but also nothing bad at all. Let's check out the door closing sound. Hmm, it's actually nice and solid. Also here from the panel gaps and so on. Also very massive, this door handle. Then inside of the doors is also a soft touch and also a structure. So that is nicely done. Look at that inlet here, beautiful. Also the handle, oh, some galvanization also around the window levers. So I like the build quality, just no felt inside covering here. Yeah, but so far looks really good. Then the steering wheel with real buttons control and even has some clicking sounds. It's cool. Also, straightforward design, heated steering wheel, button on the steering wheel, I love that. And they have this mesh structure here on the dashboard, here at the air vents, for example, it continues further on to the cockpit, and soft touch also on the top part here with a structure. This looks like really good build quality. The only thing is here in Europe, so these seats are the only ones you can get. It's a mix of leatherette and animal leather so i'm not sure which part is which one um, but that's the only one you can get in europe now so far you could always get the fabric seats as well you can still get them in the us and i think they should also offer it as an entry in the european market uh, to be more animal friendly then here this is the version with panoramic roof but still some headroom left with 189 or six for two yeah but this is a real panoramic roof still you can open as well wow it's actually not that loud from the mechanism and opens quite wide. There we go. So I like that. Yeah, CRV convertible. <laughs> you can also apply the electric shade to the panoramic roof, by the way. So when it's really, really sunny. Then here the cockpit. Wow, that looks really premium, I have to say. Look at that. Here this mesh structure looks sports car like. Then once again, the soft touch dashboard. And you would start in some base versions, for example, on the Northern American market in seven inch with the screen. This is here the nine inch screen standard in Europe. And it still has a manual control here with the volume knob. That's cool. See here, Apple CarPlay, Android Auto integration, also wireless available. And the Honda menu itself is kept relatively 
simple, straightforward, big individual buttons. You cannot do so much, but it's also not necessary. We can, for example, take a look at this power flow meter when we drive the car later on. And if you want to go to the home menu, press the button. Wow, I mean, I really love this straightforward user interface continued in the lower part, like this one here. And once again, clicking sounds, Audi goes away from that solution. Honda says, hmm, hold my Japanese beer. We're going to go for Audi uh, controls here for the climate unit, also for the fan speed. This feels premium, it looks premium. Yeah, and it also listens to as premium. Seat heating, seat cooling, individual controls. That's what I want to have in a car, this straightforward user interface. In lower part, charging, USB-A or USB-C. Inductive charging pad is not cooled, however, so it could overheat. The gear selection is a little bit weird, but then again, also not too complicated because like this, you put in the, you know, like this, you put in reverse, parking, drive, and for neutral, it's also possible. Yeah, you get along and then the driving mode selection is here on the right side. So in the sport mode, if you have an adaptive suspension, the suspension would also get a little bit stiffer. The inbuilt hybrid does not offer that. The plug-in hybrid does offer adaptive suspension. But what you get as standard are frequency adaptive dampers. That means it adapts accordingly to the impact the dampers get. And yeah, BMW sells that as adaptive suspension where it's not actively adaptive. Yeah, but for Honda here, it's standard. Actually, quite cool. Then this large middle console here with the leatherette covering. Okay, you can move that one a little bit left and right, but still quite fine from the build quality. A lot of space underneath. That's really good. This interior is so versatile and usable. Here, the cup holders. See here, um, they work well for different sizes. They're also somewhat adaptive. So I'm overall very very happy with the cockpit here so far so far steering wheel moves in and out up and down also very smooth no resistance no rattling sound whatsoever oh and that power button here lights in red digital instruments are very clear to read and you can also change the content from the steering wheel what you want to see here so here with your right thumb you control the content and then you can also activate or deactivate the head-up display. Pretty cool here, these hotkeys at the stalk column. So when I press here on the right with my index finger, directly hops to the camera view and I can also switch through the different camera views. This is here, for example, then right and left wheel, so you don't damage these alloys. And with my left thumb, I can directly hop here to the blind spot monitor view. So when Michel opens his passenger door, there you see this is the passenger side always showing the blind spot. Rear seats, first of all, look at that. The rear door opens almost 90 degrees. Great for putting child seats in and out. Then also soft touch here in the rear doors on the inside. Great build quality again. You can even get seat heating for that. And then when I'm driving as a tall person here, still have enough legroom. So remember the wheelbase has been increased a little bit. Here the headroom gets a little bit close, close here with the panoramic roof behind is a little bit better then so there's still space then if you want more space then you would not take the panoramic roof but overall the offering of space is good the rear seats are quite high so once again good for children actually and a decent comfort once again and i'm really amazed by the interior build quality here by honda usb-c charging the lower part and then we can fold down this this has no adaptive cup holders though and what's also interesting is you cannot fold the seats forward or backward, but the seat folding mechanism is cool. So you take this one, then you can adjust the angle, make it more upright or put it all the way. This is like a way sleeping position. So very rare that we see that. And then when we fold it down completely for the trunk and so on here, look at that, how the lower seating area goes flat. That's a good mechanism that the whole area then is flatter than for loading things through. Trunk is about 600 liters each or 40 cubic feet. And interesting is that the inbuilt hybrid has a little bit less liter volume than the plug-in hybrid. Soon going to tell you why. This is like the cover here. Then about a meter or 40 inches in width. That's good. So we have a full luggage setup for you here. Just to show you a sample, this is an empty. You have that they use all the height here. You can see that we have a small step, but it's actually nicely covered 
and then we have already two-third folded and the total length into the front seat here is about is 185 or 73 inches so that's actually very good and for all the dog owners especially here 83 centimeters or 32 inches in height so very well usable that's again the third reason why people go for it a lot of luggage space it's actually simple not complicated it fits a lot underneath here by the way some more space the inbuilt hybrid has actually the battery here underneath this floor that's why you lose a little bit of luggage volume underneath the plug-in hybrid would have the battery in the underfloor center of the vehicle that's why then underneath here you get a little bit more liters but the everyday usability is more or less the same can i stand underneath here ah, i can push it a little bit more upward then i can also stand underneath and if you want to secure that position here it also says hold to set heights the first manufacturer i see the there we go and then when you have hold it then you have saved this position for the next time welcome to thomas's driving lounge honda crv new generation here with the inbuilt hybrid let's go to the sport mode and do some acceleration from zero let's see how it turns out <laughs> plop that's 90 and i wasn't you know like screaming at the I like this acceleration, but more. Um, I had to secure the key here; it doesn't fly around. I was more screaming at the at the sound it made, you know. So, uh, wow, that's like, <laughs> wow, that it's interesting. And here we can directly use this small test track they have here at Honda Germany and see how it performs. So the steering is actually quite good. It doesn't feel most agile the whole vehicle. Let's let's take it that way. But the wider track here in the new generation definitely helps the vehicle so i feel it drives better and sportier than before leans a little bit into the corner the suspension is not set on the sportiest note i would say but overall it's actually quite good this is not the vehicle where you say like driving fun and driving agility is the main focus it's more about running straight motorway and being comfortable and for that the suspension is also set on the good note i would say but definitely it feels better to drive than the previous generation and that's i think the the main aspect for it suspension we will also test as for the compact soon on the open road and we'll also go to the motorway but here yeah definitely it's not the sportiest most agile feeling there for example the german competitors would be better as for the sporty driving feeling but then here with the straightforward user interface I really love this Honda approach because especially while driving it's so easy to control the temperature unit here for example and that was completely normal back in the days and now often it's gone yeah so this is something you can really praise then with the Honda CRV then here yeah. now you may be hearing that I'm in the EV driving mode so when you're driving really slow speeds easing the car in and out of a parking lot it usually goes to the EV mode to you know, save some fuel and also be silent in the neighborhood and so on and in the previous generation the direct drive that the combustion engine powers the wheels directly was only available at motorway speeds now it's also available at slower speeds so we can also have this monitor here the power flow monitor and um, always when there's like a, you know, like this, you know, there's a, there's a small white symbol, you know, uh, um, where you can see that actually, but it always depends. If you look at that while driving as a driver, you probably get mad because it constantly changes because you have the all EV mode. Then you have the, the, you know, like this direct drive where the engine directly powers the wheels. And then you have this generator mode where the combustion engine serves as generator. But then the car itself drives electric and it constantly changes depending on what is actually the best solution for this very moment but the best thing is probably as a customer not to care about that and just drive the vehicle acceleration figures are all around nine seconds by the way the front wheel drive version is a little bit better like nine seconds 9.5 for the all-wheel drive version the overdrive here, I also have it in this very vehicle, works in a way front plus rear on demand with a clutch. So it's not like a you know, permanent all-wheel drive or something. There's always something active, you know, in a way, but not like this fixed setup. 
so rear than just on demand. Here, look at that. When I turn right, this blind spot view is automatically activated here. Right set turning indicator. This is actually a cool system. And the same also happens. So left, I rather look myself, but here when I use my left index finger, then I can also activate it and have here the blind spot view to the right. So this is a very cool system. We know it from Hyundai and Kia, Genesis, but they have it then in the instruments. It's also a good solution here then in the screen. Uh, I think it's yeah, tech going forward, definitely, why not? So here when I'm turning right, once again it's activated. I mean, I do see it in the mirror in a way, and there's also the blind spot monitor in the mirror. And that maybe takes an effect on the motorway, but here is definitely a nice additional safety feature. I mean, what you heard during the acceleration was that like, the engine was really, really loud. That's because Honda is not using like the classic converter automatic gearbox, so you always have like this effect. But once again, that performance itself is also not the focus of this vehicle. Then let's get on the motorway, still in the sport mode. Let's see one more acceleration on the motorway from 50. Let's go. One hundred, one twenty, one thirty. Wow! I mean, it's okay. I mean, this is actually sufficient, and <laughs> the, the engine sounds like a sports car, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that, that's really cool. Here now at higher speeds, one hundred thirty kilometers an hour. So like, you know, like, like eighty miles an hour. It is actually quite loud as for the wind noise. You know, so that's not. The best I would say so it could be more silent at higher speeds of course in most countries you won't have really high motorway speeds but 130 is definitely a speed where it should be more silent here now there we see the small symbol here and when we see that small symbol here that means that this direct drive is active so at the moment I'm keeping constant speed and now the combustion engine is directly powering the wheels when I, let's see, when I go off the throttle there, it disappears, and then I have recuperation, so I get energy back to the battery. And then, when I'm on the throttle, yeah, then the direct drive is activated once again. When I'm accelerating harder, let's see, then it disappears, because then, when I'm in hard acceleration, the electric motor is active, and the combustion engine serves as generator. Yeah, it's, it is, in a way, complicated, but also, you could say it like it's a great idea in a way to fit the drive to in a way that it's always most efficient in every situation. But of course, is the question at the end of the day: Does it really mean that we have less consumption? We've been testing the system before, and I have to say, it's not a game changer as for the fuel economy. Yeah, so maybe it's nicely thought out, but that it's really super effective. I would also wish for a base petrol engine for the European, for the for the German market. I think they would serve the customer better by that way. And then also, for example, offer the plug-in hybrid drivetrain that you can then you know have taxation benefits uh, if if you need it. Yes, to me it's a little bit too loud on the motorway, but as for the chassis, suspension, so on, it's nice. Doesn't shake up too much. At the same time, it drives very well. Suspension, I feel, is very comfortable, also with 18-inch wheels. And the steering is awesome, you know, it's really crisp and direct. At the same time, I do not need too much force. I think exactly the right setup here for the steering. And that has always been the case with Honda. You may remember like Civic, or especially Civic Type R. It's really a lot of fun to steer these vehicles around. Just as the CRV does not have like this agile cornering focus we've shown that to you initially, that this is not like the special thing this car can do also you know but overall driving wise i'm really happy yes it doesn't offer the most driving fun but at the same time steering is crisp and good comfort riding straight and enjoying family also in the rear everything comfortable yeah, as long as you don't drive too fast or that you don't have like too much wind noise and so on but overall i think in this very segment here quite solid performance. The Toyota RAV4, by the way, is also quite loud at higher speeds, 
So that's a thing where the Germans are a little bit better as for noise, noise insulation and Lexus, of course, if you compare Toyota and Lexus. It's mostly the difference that the Lexus always has better noise insulation at higher speeds. So just to give you like some competitor insight as well. Well, the last reason why the Honda CRV works that well internationally is the low price. So you get it in the North American market for around $30,000 and it offers so much for the price. So the price performance is excellent. And also Honda usually scores quite good reliability rankings. Then again, that's the one thing I criticize today is in Europe, they go more for this high trim strategy now. So in Germany, it starts at 49,000 euros as the inbuilt hybrid and even more, around 60,000 euros for the plug-in hybrid. Always high trim on the inside, no fabric seats, always animal skin share and so on. So I think that's not the right approach to take it because I love this vehicle design-wise, the space on the interior, here, this new generation, such a great build quality on the inside. It's actually a premium build quality inside. I love that. But then again, it also has to be competitive price-wise and that works in the North American market, but it's really critical if it works in the European market. Yeah, that's, I think, the only catch for the day. Other than that, it is really, to me, one of the best SUVs in this very segment. You asked me to drive the all-new generation of the Kia Sportage. Well, here we go, let's go. So how good is it now and can it reach the top of this segment? We'll find out together, Thomas and Autogefühl. And thanks to the Heinen dealership in Germany for supplying the vehicle for us. Check it out if you wanna buy one. Then you can see here the older generation, a strong front. Here this very sporty grille, here even sportier because this is the GT line. And we also have the silver contrast here in the lower part and the sporty look right here. And of course, you see it directly here, these daytime running lights, this blade, so to speak. Wow, that looks really impressive. So big change here for the new generation, also with this new Kia logo. LED is standard for the main headlamp unit. Matrix LED is an option. Now even more interesting. So everything I'm telling you today basically counts for all the new Sportage versions worldwide. However, there's one difference. So this one here, built in Slovakia for the European market with the shorter base at 4 meters 51 or 178 inches. Then there's also long wheelbase available that is built in Korea or also for the US market in Georgia for the new generation. That's very interesting. A little bit longer wheelbase and overall 15 centimeters or five inches longer. So it's not the biggest difference, but here also that rear window graphic will look a little bit different. But from the front here, that area, all the same actually. The GT line would usually come already with 19 inch wheels. However, here 18 inch winter tires mounted. And also in the GT line, we have here the painted wheel arches in black then, which is still a contrast here to this very dark gray color we have for you here today. Then also the contrasting mirrors and still a chrome trim in the lower part than the black one in the upper part. That's a very interesting design combination. And then you have this, you know, breaking design line. They did that intentionally on purpose but I think clean design is a more beautiful design, so not a fan of this feature here. Are you? There's also a unique new rear design. The light strip does not go through, although it looks like it at first when it's not illuminated, but you can see here also pretty cool with the tail lamps right there. And also a contrasting part here, diffuser style kind of, maybe like soft off-road style or something. No fake exhaust, that's actually quite good. So a very clean and interesting design in the rear. And what's also interesting is suspension-wise, either base or here with the GT line, you automatically get the electronically controlled suspension, ECS. We will test it today. I'm really looking forward to it. Khaki, classic, but good quality. And here the controls at the sides, like that. Then press it here for the keyless entry and door closing sound. Mm, okay, but have heard it better. Yeah, and beep, beep, beep. Uh, that's of course, you know, key is not in the vehicle, ignition is on, and so on, and so on. Then inside here of the doors is, yeah, somewhat soft touch, so that's actually good. Then a lot of high gloss piano lacquer is being used. We don't like it that much, actually. But then here, the GT line also gets a microfiber at the inside of the doors. That's actually quite fancy. And then this completely new cockpit layout here with that sporty steering wheel style. Hey, and we still have real buttons at the steering wheel, left for the volume, for example, right then to control the cruise.
cruise control. Seats come fabric as base or then here in the GT line, they come with the animal free leatherette on the inside. And then here at the side parts, there's microfiber. Maybe it would have been clever to also have microfiber in the middle part, however, for more breathability. Um, but this is also, you know, a cool way here, GT line. So overall, pretty nice looking seats. But are they also comfortable? Yes, indeed. So uh, makes a very good impression so far. So um, getting along with that, one meters 86 or six foot one. This is the headroom I still have left. Although this one is here, the one with the panoramic roof. You can also um, open that one, ignition on, then you can open it and it goes quite far. And also has a cover actually. So a shade that is, you know, you can lock out the sun a little bit more. And also steering goes out, up, down. So manual way, but very good to adjust. The all new interior in the overview, really interesting. First of all, soft touch dashboard here and then two times 12.3 inch screens. That looks impressive, definitely, but I freshly cleaned that for you. Otherwise, fingerprints all over the place. And also here, this lower unit, we will take a closer look at that very soon. Steering wheel view once again, here you switch through the digital instruments on the right side, lane keeping assist on the left side, then that's, you know, the volume control I would rather use and press it here for muting it or then uh, playing it back again. Digital instruments are clear to read. My hybrid system would be, you know, visual, visually available right here, but still consumption around nine liters on one kilometer, so barely some 30 mpg. That's not as good as expected. Here, the driving modes also switch then these visualizations. That's actually quite fancy. And GPS wise, uh, you can have some basic information there, but of course only when you have the car internal GPS. Central infotainment system here with a quite easy menu, actually. Let's take a look here at the map. So this is then the inbuilt GPS and I still don't get this grappling hook effect they're using. Um, there are worse maps, but there are definitely better map software. I think that's clear. So rather would use the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto map for that. Um, other than that here, for example, to switch to the radio here, for example, so that's possible. Or then here to media when you have connected it with Bluetooth. Um, at this moment, I have connected this with Bluetooth. Soon more to that why. Here, first of all, optional Harman Kardon sound system. A uh, very crystal clear sound. However, as for the surround sound, I would prefer it to come a little bit more from the back, actually. But then let's finish up this, um, you know, this menu here. So not too much you can do with it. There's also a digital climate menu available, but usually you would all do that from below. This is what I mean. It's actually quite well done. Still, we have manual climate dials. I love to have that. That's so cool. Then they have this dual effect. So this is kind of like the climate menu, but you can switch it then to the GPS. Maybe we have some hotkeys like map and so here, but uh, and this one here then becomes the volume jog. However, since we have one at the steering wheel, I would rather leave it then here with a climate unit and to be able to control that here then all the time. Lower middle console, let's open this. And yeah, I mean, a lot of black paint, you know, like a, mm, can't there be something else? And then when you open this one, and today I cannot show the Apple CarPlay and an Auto because look at that nice cable here, which has like this, you know, iPhone, USB-C, USB Classic. And, but when I put in this one and connect the iPhone, it says cable not supported. So it does not support these third party cables. I often had it now in Hyundai or Kia vehicles and yeah, do I have to always carry original ca Apple cables, super expensive with me now all the time? That is really weird, isn't it? Then inductive charging mode also in the lower part. Here, this area with a nice shifting lever for this new dual clutch transmission, reverse and drive mode, that's it. And here, very cool, heated seats, cooled seats. There's also nice a leatherette seat that can be cooled. Also nice to have that. And also here then heated steering wheel. Great to have just individual buttons for these important functions. And then we have the drive mode selector here, for example, for sport mode or the eco mode. And there's even, uh, you know, here, this like, like a mid differential lock available. Oh, off-roading also hill descent control. So also somewhat off-road capable. And then we have either this open area or here then, yeah, <laughs> cup holders. Oh, from the uh, studio episode, they have been, you know, slowed down a little bit, but still they are really fast. Like. Bam, there we go. <laughs> and then we have this leather armrest. Let's see how, ah, that's a little bit cheaply attached. 
but then you know for all your clutter you have enough space the resolution is actually not too bad here also have in this highest spec the drone fake drone view from above rear seats here hard pack at the inside of the doors but cool door handle design and then here when the seat is to the position i would be driving i exactly fit in here also headroom wise would be a little more headroom without the panoramic roof but overall offering of space is okay also interesting integrated jacket hanger here at the back part of this this head restraint so actually a cool idea and seating position is good here also in the rear you can also adjust this back part here a little bit more more to the lying back position more upright and that's also easily done middle tunnel is somewhat present uh, in the middle part you can also sit it's actually quite soft and plush so you can use this vehicle here with five tall L's, that's possible. The middle part here, cup holes, but they are not adaptive. Oh, an interesting detail here. Two USB-C chargers integrated here in the seat. And before I said, is Thomas absolutely insane? He shows one, but he says two, one, and two. <laughs> there we go. I really like this feature that when you have the key just in your pocket and the car is closed and you approach it, peep 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 you have to wait a little bit and then without doing anything the hatch opens there's only one problem that when you go past the vehicle and you really have parked close to a wall or something then you have to just yeah disappear quickly or hold it tight manually let's check out the trunk trunk area you can get this rugged rubber pad here but of course you do not have to get it the width is about a meter of 40 inches and the length is around 80 centimeters or 31 inches the overall height really to the very top is 75 centimeters or 29 inches and then you can fold the seats from here that's actually easily done so left and right and they directly fold flat that's actually pretty cool so good organization of that and then to the front seats as i would be driving is 1 meter 65 or 65 inches what about the child safety test? Yeah, I think that's feasible. Engines, four cylinder and front wheel drive or all wheel drive on demand, either 1.6 liter diesel or 1.6 liter turbo petrol engine here with mild hybrid technology. There's also an inbuilt hybrid technology available or a plug-in hybrid and all basically based on the same engine. And for the US market, there will be a 2.5 liter natural aspirated engine, a bigger one. Welcome to Thomas's Driving Lounge with the Kia Sportage all new generation. Here the 1.6 turbo petrol engine, 180 horsepower, all wheel drive, seven speed dual clutch transmission. This one with MHEF, mild hybrid technology, so not the inbuilt hybrid, not the plug-in hybrid, the most, you know, classic one so far. Here we do have a sport mode. When we go into the sport mode, here instruments change. And let's go from now I have this car pass so it's safer for everyone then 40 kilometers an hour to let's see let's go one hundred one fifty quite smooth lane change here high speed 170. Suspension is now a little bit stiffer. And now wind speed, wind noise is picking up. But it's not too loud. So here now at 180 kilometers an hour. That's we're like close to top speed. A little bit more. Still well to control here. The ECS, electronically controlled suspension, is helping me. It's a little bit stiffer now. Yeah, closer to 190 kilometers an hour. Now we have to cancel. Still well to control on the brakes. Could be maybe a little bit poor, but well to control. Yeah, and back here to 80 kilometers an hour. So that's fine overall. The steering input here um, is quite direct, but could be maybe a little bit more natural, so to speak. Here we can also activate or deactivate the lane keeping assist, this active lane keeping assist. What I really feel is here the electronically controlled suspension. does a good job finally adaptive suspension in here for a Kia or Hyundai model, not available for all the models. And when you, for example, go back to the normal mode, you really feel that it's smoother in the ride over some bumps. And in the sport mode, you have a little bit more control. 
but then maybe also here on camera, I don't know, when I'm going like over some, you know, so some, some bumps in the road and so on, it's really like getting rougher. And once again here in the tunnel, you can see it's a little bit illuminated here, um, there and there, and then you can see how it changes here, normal mode, driving, uh, eco mode, normal sport. So uh, yeah, it's actually a nice feature. And we also have the digital speed then in the middle. Well, what's also interesting, this being the all-wheel drive model, we have these gauges here that show the distribution. So when I'm just like, you know, rather static, then actually just front-wheel drive. It's a front-wheel driven platform, but when I accelerate a little bit more, then also power to the rear wheels a little bit here, and it really depends. Here, let's let's check out normal mode, most for the front drive, front wheel wheels, but now sport mode. Let's see if that changes actually. Yeah, indeed. So in the sport mode, you see that directly more power is being transported to the rear wheels. At least that's what, what I have an impression. Let's try try that one more time. Normal mode here. Yeah, that really seems to be the case. So, and that also makes sense, we quite often see that in sport mode, more power to the rear wheel, it will still have front wheel bias, but then at least you get a little bit more power. Here, especially in normal mode, steering wheel could be giving you a little bit more feedback, I think. Um, so in the sport mode, that's a little bit better. Here, I think it's too light, that's rather than focused on that you are able to park in and out, uh, you know, a little bit easier and so on. But that suspension really happy with that so that's probably the best about this new generation so big improve in with the suspension and when you ask yourself shall I go for this adaptive suspension I would say yes it improves both comfort and sportiness on demand and at the same time here by the way turning left or right you can see that these camera images appear then there's another blind spot or <laughs> hit the turning indicate in the wrong direction the police see that I think they have better business to uh, attend to. So once again here, left, and then I see the camera image on the left side. There's also the blind spot monitor in the side mirrors, but this is like a good addition that you can also see that as an additional warning because we know blind spot accidents are quite frequent still and glad that we have these warners. I'll put it here to the sport mode one more time. Yeah, and the sport mode have a little bit more feedback from that steering wheel. Uh, normal, it's just too too vague actually. Better in the sport mode, but still very light. And uh, steering doesn't give me a direct control like driver, steering, and road. So that is not that present. It's not super bad or something. It's just that you don't have like this natural connection, so to speak. But once again, especially in the sport mode, um, the suspension also gets a little bit stiffer, but without getting super uncomfortable but the normal mode I think the suspension is the best because it still doesn't shake up too much but it's really comfortable and suspension wise probably the best Kia suspension we had so far and we often said that hey you know Hyundai Kia and also Genesis this great this great this good but suspension wise mm, they lag a little bit behind here it's not the case absolutely on top with the competition or maybe even better than some of the competitors so top-notch suspension here in this case really um, yeah that's also one of the key findings for today so really good to go for this ECS which is again standard in this GT line we have here today one more time acceleration let's go to the sports mode when we are already at speed here from 85 kilometers an hour let's go Thirty and one fifty. That should be enough for now because I also want to test with the, with the noise. Let's go back to the normal mode. Here at one fifty kilometers an hour, some wind noises definitely. Overall, noise insulation has been improved. Let's see what would be a very good highway speed. Yeah, I think you're one one twenty five, something about that. Yeah, like seventy miles an hour, one twenty. I would have expected a little bit more improvement as for the noise insulation, so um, that could be better. Here now, when I've set the cruise control, and also with the active steering, let's see, now I picked up, yeah. So now I can 
increased speed here. Good that we still have real buttons at the steering wheel, so that's easy to control while driving. And now I keep my hands on the steering wheel. Yes, it's already warning me. And now let's see, the motorway goes in a slight bend. What is what this car doing? Is it smooth, how it keeps me in the lane? Let's see about that. So it is notable, yes, but so far quite smooth. Earlier I went into a construction lane and that was actually not that well done. So car didn't catch up with that. But here when we have like very clear lines, it's actually no problem. And that can also, uh, you know, be quite good but yeah as for the wind noises mm, it's not too windy outside today but I feel wind noise so noise insulation wise they could have done a little bit better obviously they didn't pay too much attention to that maybe just paid it <laughs> just all the attention to the suspension then but nevertheless it's actually a, a nice ride if you compare the driving to the previous generation, so the chassis feels a little bit stiffer, so better in handling. And of course, you somehow get a different impression because here of this, you know, of this dual screen, but yeah, you gotta clean it all the time as well. Mm. But driving wise, it doesn't feel that it would have been like the, you know, the, like the biggest step ever from generation to generation. So, I would say if you really like you know, the new digital gauges or so and that would be super important to you then it might be a big step but if you're now driving the previous generation Sportage and ask yourself do I really need to sell my, my, my currently, current one and need to get the new generation I think the previous generation was also fine you know so sometimes there are new generations where you really say like oh my god this is so much better this really, you know, like the previous generation looks kind of like bad in comparison to that. But here, yeah, I think the previous generation will be just fine. There's a slight improvement uh, in driving, definitely, but not the huge, huge one. Especially when you compare like normal suspension. But biggest difference, once again, suspension. And where you say, when you say, yeah, so far, not too much comfort, then get one with the ECS and you'll be just fine. Here, the GT line is also a nice pick with these uh, leatherette. Uh, Alcantara mixed seats so this also will be quite good by the way also once again good with the buttons here you can also deactivate the active lane keeping assist at any time just with the press of a button and I really like that you know and also that we are able to control the climate unit here while driving like this here just with a manual way I really like that mm, I rather not change to the GPS hotkeys here I rather leave it here on the climate menu that I can see everything there but I really think that, is, you know, once again confirmed here in the driving part, they found that this right user interface mix. I still have the screen, yes, with the <laughs> known problems with the uh, uh, non-working third-party cables, as I mentioned earlier. But then again, I do have the real buttons. And here, when I want the heated steering wheel, I just press one button and that's it. And I can concentrate on driving still. And that's really, really good. So once again, suspension is the one I like best. Steering could be a little bit better, noise insulation could be a little bit better. Definitely improvement if you compare the previous generation. Overall, if you compare to competitors, they are doing a lot of things very, very well here with the all new Sportage. So definitely one of the hot competitors here in this compact to mid-size SUV segment. Size always <laughs> depending on the definition uh, which, which country you're from. You wanted to see the all new Hyundai Tucson on our channel and we directly take it against one of the main competitors, the VW Tiguan. Approximately same price, approximately same size. And I can tell you a lot of things are quite similar, but a lot of things are really different. Who will win this test? Let's start in the front. Here, the only generation of the Hyundai Tucson looks so cool in the front with this new huge front grille, widely drawn. And look at that. The daytime running light is so nicely integrated that looks really futuristic. And I've been driving with this vehicle around now for quite some time and it really gets the looks. So I'm driving and people are like, what's that? It's like, whoa, that looks amazing. So really very seldom that we get the looks in a compact or mid-size SUV, compact or mid-size depending on where you live of course. And then the VW Tiguan has a more angular design in front, recently facelifted. Here they made this lip a little bit longer that it you know, looks even more masculine here in the front. The headlamps by the way 
LED or matrix LED. Whereas here you still start with halogen and an optional LED. So a little bit more elaborated lighting options than here with the Tiguan. This is the R-Line by the way, the sporty look, but the whole front has been redesigned for all models. The R-Line a little bit sportier from the lower bumpers. So looking forward, I mean, both look really cool on the front, I think. What's your favorite here in the first design look? Welcome to our review forest. Here in the rear of the vehicles, all new Hyundai Tucson. Look at that, this claw design for the tail lamps and the light strip goes all the way across the vehicle from left to right. That looks really stylish. Turning indicators and hazard lights, however, placed in the lower area. That's a little bit strange. And no fake exhaust tips whatsoever. A crossover look then here in the lower part. So I think this is really well done. Whereas here with the VW Tiguan in the R-Line, Auto Gefühl, fake exhaust police alert. Yeah, I don't think that's really necessary. But the other, you know, design highlights here are actually quite nicely done. Since the face it, there's a modern signature also for the rear. And again, a little bit more angular, this whole design. But I think once again, design-wise, you can easily go for both. The length of the new Tucson, 4 meters 50 or 177 inches. It's the same predecessor. And I mean, look at that really spectacular lines right here. So, wow, the tools they use in the, in the plant, they must be really complicated. So, wow, and then kind of coupe design in this area, wheels 17 to 19 inch. And now the very interesting thing is with the Tiguan, I would say it looks a little bit more conservative if you compare it to the Tucson. Look at that in the side profile, not that spectacular. It has the same length in this version here we get in Europe. However, we can also get the Tiguan All Space, and that one has the same length than the normal US Tiguan, which is then 20 centimeters or 8 inches longer than the Tucson, has more space in the rear. However, today the short wheel based version, and both are actually facelifted. Wheels, option even 20 inch here, and we have them here today in black style. This, of course, looks then more massive. Once again in the R-Line, you're also with these sporty accentuations and also more chrome used in the side bumper. Well, pricing-wise, this is really interesting. Think about US prices, $25,000 are the entry prices each, actually. And then it depends on, in Europe, you still can get something below 30,000 euros or below 30,000 pounds when you go with the entry-level version of the Tiguan in the short base style. However, the Tiguan Allspace is more expensive. Yeah, and why is that? Well, the Allspace, the US version, is built in Mexico, and then it's more expensive to sell in Germany. And the short base version here is built in Germany, and that's also then cheaper for Europe. So, basically, European customers are better off than here with the short base version. And in the clash of the turning indicators, here cascading style in the Matrix LED option for the Tiguan, whereas the Tucson is a little bit less spectacular in the front. And that also accounts here for the rear. I mean, this cascading style, some like it, some don't like it. What about you? I think it's, you know, really attractive and why not? Now the interior with a short look head to head here, the new Tucson interior and directly over to the Tiguan interior. What's your first impression? Tell me in the comments. And of course, our favorite and famous door closing sound test. Quite good, already for the Tucson. Yeah, and even more sophisticated for the Tiguan. So these little details, that's where they still lead. But Hyundai is definitely catching up with what else? Let's find out. Key fob comparison, Hyundai Tucson, Tiguan. And I think in this case, which one would you go for? I think I would pick the Hyundai here. Interior of the Tucson here, soft touch at the top part. And also here, a soft leatherette. Cover here for your arm, for your elbow. Then the modern steering wheel design with this open spoke design really reminds us of Audi, right? You know, in the Audi A6 and A8, for example, we have the same steering wheel design. Fabric seats in black or also in gray are available and they are also the way to go for to be more breathable in summer times. Definitely a step forward as for the interior, but there's a catch to come. But first to some lovely details here, the turning indicator. The Stockholm, wow, this is really cool. What a nice detail. See this, let's say, crystalline structure knurling around. This is such a small detail, but gives so much more premium feeling. And you also see this kind of hoop design goes around the inside of the vehicle. This gives you some, let's say, boat or 
yard atmosphere, you know, in a sense. Getting inside in the Tucson, you already have a good upright SUV seating position, so it's actually a good compromise of size. And one with a six or six with one, plenty of headroom left, no problem at all. And you have a very decent and comfortable seating position. And the steering wheel here, manual control in and out, up and down. So overall, then seating wise, well done. I like the steering wheel button though here. So lane keeping assist here as well, and that is working very well on the motorway, by the way. Also in the Tucson, you can still get analog instruments, 4.2 inch in a small screen on the inside, but these here are the optional 10.25 inch digital instruments. And according to the driving modes, they change the character right here. That's of course a very fancy feature, nicely done. And here in the middle part, you have this whole black panel, optional. So you start with the eight inch screen. This is the optional 10.25 inch screen. And then you always have, you know, this here, this area, and yeah, touch only control, capacitive buttons. Mm. No, 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 no. Sorry, I don't like them. Real buttons would have been better once again. I don't get this trend in the industry. And here then, some details to the screen, like this. It's touch, like this, and then you have this kind of main menu. You have a hotkey to access the map. But uh, this one is also not, let's say, that much up to date. You see, it's not that fast. Mm. So I think they could have gone through a little bit more effort for that. The Apple CarPlay integration looks like this, and the sound system inbuilt here is actually quite decent, I have to say. And, you know, really likable. And here we go. We go for the CarPlay menu. Lower middle console then with two USB-A chargers, then manual gearbox for the day, but there's also dual clutch available. Heated steering wheel here, you change the driving modes. A little bit complicated to do that while driving. And you have here some adaptive cup holders like this. Rear door for the Tucson. Hard pack, no soft touch, but at least here, the nice fabric inserts. Rear seating comparison here in the Tucson. As I would be driving in the front, still a little bit of leg room left and here the back part of the seat can be adjusted, a little bit more upright like this or a little bit more sleeping position. Now the Tiguan, also soft touch at the top part at the inside of the doors and even softer here for your elbows, so that's actually quite equal. Then this is the R-Line, so it's a little bit more special, but you can also get normal black or beige fabric seats. These R-Line seats have special microfiber situations. Uh, of course, they're a little bit more sophisticated, but in general also the ergonomics and the quality of the seats here is a little bit better. New steering wheel here since the facelift and yeah, look at that. Capacitive buttons then here for the higher trims. Hmm, there we go. It disappears and after a while when the ignition is off, but they are kind of illuminated. I don't know about these capacitive buttons, so especially while driving, they are more complicated to use, definitely, and you always try to find, like, what am I doing here? So that's definitely a step backwards with the face safety of the Tiguan. Seating position, however, really cool. On the one hand, they are a little bit firmer, these seats, then they have more accentuations here in the R-Line. Overall, I have to say, the seating comfort is good with both vehicles, but a little bit better here even with the Tiguan. Also, a lot of headroom is left here. That's actually comparable. And also the steering wheel in and out, up and down. Yeah, it feels a little bit smoother to control, but both vehicles, again, a good compromise and good seating comfort also with tall adults. In the interior overview, you would start with analog instruments, then optional digital instruments and 10 inch. And once again, the steering wheel here in the R-Line, so sportier grip. And then on the right side, you would start with a small 6.5 inch, then optional 8 inch, or comes with the elegance trim level already. So most with, will come with the 8 inch, and that one also has still manual knobs for zooming and also for the volume. Here, the 9.2 inch, the top one, has these capacitive volume buttons, but yeah, not too good. I would stick with the 8 inch one. CarPlay at the moment with wireless control. And then here with the facelift, new capacitive volume control, um, <laughs> temperature control, sorry. Yeah, all going past capacitive now, I don't like that. But the base, the very base version I heard or saw in the configurator still has the knobs, so that would also be maybe a reason to stick with lower or anti trim level models. Lower part then, inductive charging pit and two USB-C chargers. Then the DSG shifting lever has also been revised here with the facelift. And we have cup holders, which can be folded out. So I do it parallel. Look at that, bang. <laughs> okay, here we go. And then there's the middle armrest, slide a little bit forward or fold it up 
for summer space. If you don't go for the panoramic roof, you can have these additional storage spaces here up in the ceiling. That looks, hmm, what does it remind me of? Hmm. The infotainment system recently received an upgrade. That was the CarPlay integration. Now you can go back once again and the, um, you know, the quality of the sound system, because here's the Harman Kardon sound system, is really excellent. So if you're a music lover, this Harman Kardon sound system is really awesome, I have to say. Then the normal main menu. So since the software upgrade, this is now faster. Before it was absolute catastrophe. And then here the map, you can see here, yeah, it's not too fast either here. So it's better now with the update, but still not the best infotainment system. I think they have made their infotainment systems just more complicated now at VW. Yeah, and this um, slaps giving gesture. <laughs> I don't know. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Yeah, but actually useless gesture, I think. And the digital instruments, you can put the map all over the screen or have this view or more classic one. And then you can also change the interior parts of that. And here we go with the head up display. At least we have one in a Tucson. You don't have one at all, but that is not a proper one. But here projected onto this small layer, that's a little bit weird, of course. Hard pack also in front of the doors for the Tiguan. So that's in both cases. And then here we have a little bit more leg room. I feel you sit a little bit more upright than in the rear as well. This is the short wheelbase version. When you have the long wheelbase version, you will have even more legroom. So in the US comparison directly, the Tiguan definitely has way more legroom than in any case. And here also the angle of the back part can be adjusted a little bit more upright or a little bit more backward. And the funny thing here is, here, the bench can be slid forward or backward. And that way, even in the short wheelbase version already, you can make the trunk a little bit larger or you can have more leg room. So in this case, here a little bit more flexible with the Tiguan and you also have the same cool design and here for the seat, the single seat set up, both vehicles by the way with Isofix on the outside. Interesting by the way that here at the Tucson, the Hyundai logo is hidden behind this glass panel so you can't touch this, can't touch this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when you might think the Tucson does not have a rear wiper, it does, it's hidden here underneath the rear wing. And now the fight of the trunks. Here, the cover is very nicely done with the rails left and right. And also to fold the seats, it's a really cool solution. So easy and they directly fold flat. They directly fold flat. <laughs> okay, that didn't work, but you can use your luggage then to fold them flatter. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yeah, that's life and auto crew. Here the normal trunk length is 33 inches for the Tucson or 84 centimeters. And the width here, let's take a look at that. Yeah, good meter or a good 40 inches. And that's the same almost with the Tiguan short wheelbase version. Overall, really, really versatile and very well to use. The Tiguan here in the short wheelbase version, again, the length pretty similar, a little bit more, 34 inches or 86 centimeters. And the width here, once again, also a meter or 40 inches. You can see here, the difference is that this cover automatically goes up. Which one is better? Yeah, you can argue pro and con, definitely. But here, it's good that we also have these mechanisms here to fold the seat. And yeah, also in the one part that was going, staying up. Yeah, and here, it's not that easy to um, fold them down. But overall, quite equal. However, if you go for the US version of the Tiguan or the Tiguan Allspace, then here additional 140 liters because the car is a little bit longer than the Tiguan wins it as for the capacity, but it's also long on the exterior. But as they are right here, that is quite equal. There's one really unique feature here with the Tucson. Just have to key in my pocket. And here we go. So no need to touch any sensor or something. Just having the key in your pocket, the car is closed, you approach the vehicle, stand a few seconds behind it, and then the hatch automatically opens. And when you have everything you know in your hand, carrying something, so easy to get it then in the vehicle. Fans of gas struts to hold up the hood now already have a winner. The Tucson does not have one, but the Tiguan still has gas struts, unlike in the new Golf 8. Yeah, I mean, it's still a detail, but details are the things we always are keen to look at. So what about the engines? Here with the Tiguan, 
1.5 liter TSI turbo petrol engine, four cylinders, or a two liter TSI. Then there's a 1.4 liter PHEV available or a two liter diesel. Today, the 1.5 liter. Both vehicles are available with front wheel drive or all wheel drive and also with manual gearbox or automatic gearbox and they use a dual clutch transmission. Then the Hyundai Tucson, all set sails on the 1.6 liter turbo, at least in Europe, and that is available also as a hybrid and a plug-in hybrid. And in the US, you get a 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine and they also offer a 1.6 liter diesel. We have both then in a somewhat comparable style today. The, here the 1.6 liter petrol engine and the 1.5 with the Tiguan so it won't make such a power difference. But one thing we can already say about these two engines, they are both not that good in the fuel economy. Here a little bit less than eight liters on one kilometers. Here with the Tiguan, a little bit more than eight liters on one kilometer. Both not good at all. So around 30 MPG US, a little bit more than 30 MPG UK, that should be better. Welcome to Thomas's comparison driving lounge, starting with the Hyundai Tucson, because that's the all new model, the Tiguan the new facelift and we'll put it on the motorway, German Autobahn, and we'll go second gear. 40 kilometers now, and I'll put it in sport mode, so it, you know, turns up a little bit higher, actually. And, once again, let's go! Yeah, racing style! Yeah! <laughs> So that's 150 kilometers an hour. I think that's enough for now. And after feeling I haven't closed the window properly because there's it's really like a lot of wind noises here and a high frequency sound from the side window. And already here at 130, 140 kilometers an hour. Hmm, that's not too good. So not the best ratings for high speed wind noises. Um, as for the stability here, we have the standard suspension mounted. <laughs> kids waving. It's not that safe to wave, of course, you know, but when kids are waving, why not wave back? You know, they feel happy then. So then, here, lane change, higher speeds. Of course, it's an SUV, but it doesn't shake up too much. So overall, it's quite okay suspension-wise, but steering-wise, it feels really loose. There's hardly any feeling. In the sports mode here, I have a little bit more... F here, see? Now, I'm not sure if you picked it up on camera, but below 120 kilometers an hour, so below 75 miles per hour, then this, you know, I'm not sure if it's turbulence by the side mirror because it's so large, I don't know, but then it disappears. So, for normal US highway speeds, you know, 60, 70, 80 miles per hour, that should be quite okay, but you've seen it. It's already picking up at about 75, 75 miles per hour. So depending on where you live, really not that pleasant. I'm, I'm really surprised because I didn't know, was it in the last generation? I think not. That's really weird, I have to say. So back to the steering. Um, when I'm in the eco mode, the normal eco mode, then it's like no feeling at all. In the sports mode, it does give you a little bit more feedback, definitely. Interesting also, you can see it here very well now when we're in the tunnel. So the instruments, they switch like this, normal mode, and then sports mode, yeah, this red mode. And this is a very cool feature, brings some more emotion inside the vehicle, that it really switches according to the driving mode you're in, so why not? We have the manual gearbox here today, um, and the shifting process is actually quite nice, so no doubt about that. Still, I would recommend the dual clutch transmission, the automatic transmission as an option. And you will, you know, have it in, in a lot of versions anyway. The thing is, um, to me, the clutch has no feeling, you know. So, um, especially when you use first gear and start driving, there's so much play in the clutch and there's no real feedback. So, um, I mean, I grew up in Germany with manual drive only. So, back in the days, Damn it, I'm getting old. <laughs> yeah, um, back in the days, a couple of decades ago, people were only driving manuals or most of the time, and they were also cheap and so on. And of course, nowadays in the US anyway, but also in Europe, automatics are still on the rise, and you know, electric vehicles anyway, automatic, of course. 
So the manual will die out. I can promise that it will die out. Sorry. Yeah, it will be something for, you know, like specific sports cars, which are still being offered as manual. But for normal vehicles, the manual gearbox will die out, definitely. Yeah, and as I said, to play with the clutch is not that easy here. And I have to say that, uh, once again, being a yeah, native manual user, is, is it something like that? <laughs> yeah, but anyway, uh, rest of that. So, criticize some things now, but the good thing about this vehicle is it doesn't feel too big, but it already gives you this you know, grown-up SUV seating position and also driving position. Here in our first gear, you have to give it a lot of gas that it doesn't die, actually. But then second gear and so on, it's, it's okay. The turbo engine here, you know, we have it here in the higher horsepower spec of the 1.6 liter turbo. Front wheel drive only is okay power-wise. You've seen it also acceleration-wise on the motorway, so you'll also be fine with the entry-level engine. So you can also keep the price down. In the US, our friends in the US, we'll get the 2.5 liter naturally aspirated engine. That's also a good choice. You can also go for that. You do not have to go necessarily for the hybrid or the plug-in hybrid. This one here with the mild hybrid system, but does it change so much for the fuel economy? No, <laughs> it doesn't. Maybe a little bit, but I felt that in the 1.5 TSI of the Tiguan, it does a little bit more. However, it doesn't do so much. Um, yeah, that's what I meant here. So um, I, I'm really a skilled manual driver, but sometimes even here I fail then with the first gear and you know, that, that doesn't happen usually. That was a little bit too much gas then here. <laughs> yeah, maybe I'm still in that, in that racing mode. So once again here on the motorway. And the good thing about this vehicle here gives you a relaxed, calm seating position and also the whole driving characteristics is rather set on comfort. You will be fine with the normal suspension. If you want more comfort or if you want more variety between comfort and sportiness, you can now go for the ECS. That's this electronically controlled suspension, adaptive suspension, then like the, you know, like DCC at Volkswagen. So you can go for that, but you do not have to. This vehicle here, to me, is still one of the very good price performance picks when you want to keep the price low and then don't go for higher versions, keep it with the fabric seats here because they also offer good climate comfort. So when it's hot in summer, it's not that hot on the seats here. So that's definitely the cool thing. And what I also realized now when driving um, here and there, people really like the looks of this vehicle. So a lot of people having like, a, what, 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 what's that, what's that? I haven't seen that one ever. So the exterior, definitely is going very well with people. <laughs> That's interesting. Um, so let, let's pick a little bit more speed now. And you see, even when we are at speed already, and if I just keep it in the eco mode, we can still accelerate quite nicely. Then again, the wind noise is here pick up. And no, it's from not from the camera. The camera is on the inside. <laughs> we have someone on the inside. So now, higher speeds here in the corner. Again, suspension-wise, gives me good feeling, but here, Steering-wise, hardly any feeling, and so I don't have a good connection, car, driver, and road. And let's now listen again. When is this wind noise cancelling? Let's see. Say, uh, sailing mode, by the way, with uh, MHF. Here, 115 kilometers an hour. So about around 70 miles an hour. I still hear it a little bit and absolutely gone. Whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah. Around one, one kilometers or 60 miles an hour. That's definitely not up to the game and not promising, you know, what, what it holds on the exterior. So I have to say, when I saw this one for the first time, exterior and also interior, how flexible it is and, you know, the room concept, it's just so awesome. I thought like, this must be now probably the best compacts slash mid-size SUV, depending on the market. But now driving it, it's not a bad vehicle now when driving it. Not at all. It's still a good price performance pick. But I have to say, I'm really a little bit disappointed from the driving impression I have in here now. Here we're at a little bit lower speeds. Countryside road and so on. This is where the car more feeds at home. Like, you know, an easy cruise vehicle. And also, as the name says, a little bit, well, just driving to Tucson, 
yeah, also a beautiful area there. I'd love to be back there at, at one point. And, you know, these connecting highways then, this is also where this vehicle is meant to drive. And once again, not to pick on the exterior, but already quite spacious on the interior and super relaxed now on these roads. And also the wind noises don't play such an effect. And very comfortable once again in the fabric seats here. So this is actually very decent then. So we have switched to the Tiguan and where is the Tiguan worse or better? Exactly this we're going to find out and we start with discipline where it's better and that's the steering and the overall handling feeling. And I'm just in normal comfort mode and the steering is just more precise. It does give me a better feeling of what I'm doing. It's you know, soft in normal comfort mode, but you still have a good control over the car and you know what you're doing. So definitely that's also just more fun even if you're not driving that sporty. And you can also have the driving mode put to sport. This one here is equipped with the DCC, the ADAPT suspension. That's of course a little bit unfair that in this case, but even without the DCT, DCC, the car gives a better handling feeling. With the DCC, when you put the sport mode then in the ADAPT suspension here, then also the suspension is a little bit stiffer and gives you more feedback. Of course, that reduces the comfort a little bit when you're driving the motorway. Overall, However, I think suspension-wise, it's a little bit better, but especially with the DCC. At the later stage, of course, it would be very interesting to compare the new ECS adapter suspension by Hyundai against that one. We have the DSG dual clutch transmission here, so we only could get it with that one. Not sure, not sure if they offer uh, manuals as a, as a press vehicle. Uh, that's of course a little bit more comfortable here, but you can also get it for the Hyundai Tucson. As for the engine, comparable power, this one here 150 horsepower, so a little bit less horsepower. Then there would have been the 2 liter TSI with a little bit more horsepower. So yeah, that was a tricky question then, uh, which one we should go for. So we decided to go for this one, which is more equal in the, um, you know, in the displacement figure. Here in the tunnel, you can see how it looks like in the dark. You can also very well see the digital instruments and especially this, you know, slalom discipline, the car just keeps it more subtle. And even here with the 20 inch wheels, it's still somewhat comfortable. That also speaks for the vehicle. 20 inch here mounted on this one here today, 19 inch it was with the Hyundai. We are put in sports mode and also the gears are turning up higher on here in the automatic gearbox. And uh, we'll start a little bit faster since there's a vehicle behind us. So from 60 kilometers an hour, let's go. And that's 150 kilometers an hour. So yeah, I think that we were a little bit quicker with the Hyundai. It has a little bit more horsepower. Uh, here, of course, was a little bit easier because we have the automatic gearbox and Noise insulation wise, this is the biggest difference. Way better with the Tiguan. I wouldn't have expected that. Now at 150 kilometers an hour and still so easy to drive it with, uh, you know, in a fast way. Here with the DCC, of course, also super stable on the road. And the steering feeling is definitely really good. Good control of the vehicle. And yeah, so high speed driving, that's where the Germans still are ahead of them. Um, yeah, I mean, it's maybe also a German thing because we can drive really fast here. Yeah, not sure how important it is to you, but it always speaks for the vehicle definitely when it's good performing at higher speeds. And what I really wonder is, here the Tiguan, in this generation, yes, there has been the facelift, but the base generation here, it's now already a couple of years old, was like 2014, 2015 or something like that. And it still feels really, recent, you know. So a lot of areas where both vehicles came very close, but definitely here in the driving part, the Tiguan really owns the Tucson. What's your favorite for today and why? Tell me in the comments. Well, what about me? Definitely on the exterior, both are just great. I really like both designs. The owner of the Tucson, especially in the new generation, this has been a big change compared to the predecessor. However, the Tiguan, the more angular design, so especially here in the R-Line, it just looks sportier, but you can also get the Tucson in the N-Line, and then you also have a sportier 
atmosphere. But I just like both. So exterior, I think, both are somewhat the winners. Interior-wise, I would still go with the Tiguan. The build quality is just better. You have a premium atmosphere in the Tiguan, whereas in the Tucson it's more or less, you know, average, I would say. And the offering of space, both good, actually, and they are very versatile. When you have the US version of the Tiguan or the Tiguan Allspace, you have even more space. But that one is, of course, also longer than, than this Tucson right here. And driving-wise, so before I was expecting it will be a very, very close call. And in a lot of aspects, it is actually. But the driving part today decided the race for the Tiguan. It's more agile to drive, gives you a more premium feeling. Also, the steering is just more precise. It has more driving fun, whereas the Tucson drives really decently. No doubt about that, but it's not as much fun to drive the Tucson than it is to drive the Tiguan. And that, to me, would be the crucial factor. However, pricing-wise, I mean, they start somewhat similar, but at the end of the day, when you check the options list, the Tucson might be cheaper, at least list price-wise. And then it really depends on what price do you get at the dealers. And for example, in a lot of European markets, the, uh, the case is that there are better leasing rates for the Tiguan than for the Tucson. And then pricing-wise, the race could be for the Tiguan again. So overall, I have to say, exterior quite equal. Interior, the Tiguan is better. Driving-wise, Tiguan is actually way better. Pricing-wise, it really depends on the market and on the concise deal. So the overall winner to me is the Tiguan for today. I'm really surprised that I thought Tucson would have been better as I saw it exterior and interior wise, but clearly the driving part is where the Tucson lost the race here today. However, still both vehicles are very good pick as for a price performance ratio in this Combi 2 mid-size SUV segment. So these are also two vehicles, both I would, you know, actually recommend when you ask me which SUV would I go for. They are not too big, but not too small. Actually, have a good and right size. Really looking forward to your comments. Which one do you think is better? Well, we all know it's a global world and car manufacturers certainly don't make that any easier to navigate. So this is the Nissan X-Trail, which is brand new to Europe. US viewers will have known this as the Nissan Rogue, which has existed in the States in this form for a year. But the new news is there's a new engine that this is being launched with, a new powertrain in Europe. And of course, it's built on the same platform as the Nissan Qashqai in Europe or the Nissan Rogue Sport in the States. So I hope that's managed to make it a little bit less confusing. So here are the questions that we're gonna be trying to answer. One, is this credible competition for its German rivals? Have Nissan finally managed to elevate themselves out of what you could describe as the budget sector? This is a premium SUV. That's Nissan's statement. We're gonna take a closer look and find out. All of that starts with the design language. So as we look straight on at the front of this thing, what does it communicate to us? Nothing here exactly to blow your mind. And honestly, I think that that's a good thing. SUVs are a very difficult design proposition because they're large by nature, but you don't want to visually impose too much. Global products are even harder because in a country like America, visual presence is really important, Europe less so. So what you're trying to do always is find the right balance between those two things. The problem with managing to hit those design briefs is that you can risk ending up with a product that's neither one thing nor another. So for me, what Nissan have done really well with this design is that it doesn't make too big or too specific of a statement. Nothing here really blows you away, but I don't think that's a bad thing. What do you think? Four meters, 68 or 184 inches in length. I have to say that the side profile of this vehicle is a little bit more of a taste from the front. There's nothing particular here to hate, but for me also nothing particular here to fall in love with. I do like the rugged feeling of these plastic trim elements on the wheel arches and on the bottom. And I will say that in contrast to a lot of other SUVs that you can have on the market, they feel properly solidly built and actually as though they're designed for off-road use. And I like that. That feeling is echoed in the 19 inch wheels that we have here and tires that look rugged enough to take a farm track such as this, but still not make you feel uncomfortable on the road. Looking at the side profile in total, I would definitely say that there is something reminiscent of Hyundai of this to me. 
Now, that's not that there's anything bad with Hyundai's design, and that's not that there's anything bad with this design either, but I have the same kind of sensation of them both. Let's start off with the key. What I really like about this is it's very light, and that's nice to carry around in your pocket. You know what? The more cars we're testing now, the better we're finding the finish quality of the build. I think that is a very high quality cabin proposition. And there are really nice details right throughout this thing. The last time I owned a Nissan, I did not think that I was ever gonna be looking at a cockpit that looked like that with the word Nissan written on it. They've come on so far. This really does speak to a new quality and a new approach to styling. It just makes me feel good. And you know what is very much reminiscent of its German rivals. So when I see this cockpit, I do start to think maybe, just maybe, there could be some viable competition. Let's take a seat inside and see if it feels as good as it looks. Well, right from the moment you take a seat in here, again, the overriding sensation you have is, wow, Nissan, really? Now, I think the fairest competition for this car just being honest, is probably gonna be the Toyota RAV4. And Toyota, I'm a massive fan of, but I've also been complaining about for years. It's almost as though they were designing their interiors as if they'd never seen a car before for the longest time. And you could say the same thing of Nissan. But whereas Toyota, I still think are on the road to discovery in terms of making an interior that matches the quality of the people they want to compete with, this seems to have gotten it absolutely right. Everywhere you look, the material selection looks, feels, and behaves in a premium manner. I'm five foot 10 or 178 centimeters, but I do have a very long torso. So you can compare me seated down to somebody of around about six foot one or six foot two. And as you can see, I have plenty of headspace here. That said, the seat is in its lowest possible position. As far as the seat itself goes, we have one under the top trim here, which means I have non-leather seats easy to keep clean and nice and hard wearing. It feels comfortable, but I don't know that I feel that well held. So it'll be interesting to see how it behaves once we actually start driving. Now, as far as the position within the car itself is concerned, I really feel nicely bedded down into this vehicle and everything has adjusted really nicely for me to feel good. Truthfully, I never have quite understood the point of motorized steering wheel adjustments. It just takes a hundred times longer than it needs to. I'm a fan of the manual and it takes no time at all for me to put this wheel exactly where I want it to be. Steering wheel itself, really nicely finished. As a piece of design, that really works for me. It communicates the brand, but look at these lovely buttons. I can push and feel these without needing to look at them at all. And there is no danger of me pressing something I didn't intend, even though there is clearly an awful lot of capacity to change things using these controls alone. This is the driver's cockpit as Cornelius is showing you. That's around about 12 inches from corner to corner, which coincidentally is the same as the infotainment screen as well. As you can see here, this is the standard display that it comes with, but of course you can adjust everything from the steering wheel here. So if I push on the settings, you can see how I can cycle through the various different displays. Now, although we've been doing a little bit of driving shooting just now, which has changed yet, I definitely think it's worth pointing out that this number right here was at 6.4 liters per 100 kilometers for efficiency. And the reason that's worth mentioning is that I believe for the first time ever, that is exactly what the manufacturers told us this car would deliver. So, two thumbs up for that. Now, if we take a look slightly further over, you can see the infotainment screen. That obviously is embedded into the dashboard and more or less has everything that you would expect. It's responsive, but not that responsive. The screen is a high gloss type, which means it's going to be showing up your fingerprints. Cornelius has been bravely standing outside <laughs> during the rain, but I asked him just to hop in here for one moment because I want to show you this. Now, if I pop the car into reverse, this is hardly a new feature and I'm sure you've seen it before, but this aerial view on this car, which doesn't always work spectacularly well everywhere that I've seen it applied, actually works here great. If you can see, I'm just reversing onto a very narrow, very small road in a vineyard and it allows me to do that really effectively. 
Now, the reason I'm particularly impressed by that is, as you can see, there are rain all over the cameras, but this system still works really well indeed. Slightly further down and hooray, look at this, an orgy of physical buttons that I can press. I'm not gonna care about most of these things, but I really enjoy being able to adjust the heating and cooling without ever needing to look at or think about it in any way, shape or form. Heated seats on this car, heated steering wheel, and easy to adjust fan speed right at a finger's push. Brilliant. Also well done Nissan for this execution down here. I love the fact that it has USB-C and USB-A right there in the dash. Yes, I know that this is the modern standard, but let's be realistic, 90% of everything I own still operates off one of those. This is an S21 Ultra, so it's a big phone, and as you can see, it fits in beautifully. Now, I have a case on my phone, which means inductive charging can be a little temperamental in cars. So I'm sure if I took that off, it would work perfectly. However, they have given me this nice light down here. I'll just see if I can show you with the case off. That really does let you know if your phone is charging and what the state of it is. He said optimistically, come on phone, there we go. And you can see I have a helpful orange light so I can tell at a glance that everything is working exactly as it should do. Here we have the pure electric mode for this vehicle. Now it only has a 2.1 kilowatt battery. So when you ask the manufacturer, what does that really mean in terms of pure electric driving? They'll tell you that's three kilometers. Drive mode selector here. And then finally at the rear, the storage area for everything else. This car's killer feature was always going to be space. It sells an astonishing number already in China. And as we all know, the Chinese really, really love the space in the back. So that should not come as a huge surprise to you. Let's have a look. Well, this seat is set for me, so it's really an unfair comparison. I'm gonna slide over instead to where Cornelius sits. Cornelius, who has a normal body, is over six feet tall. And as you can see, look just how much room I have back here. Absolutely loads. And I've even got a couple of inches spare space above my head. Thank you, Nissan, for not thinking, as others do, that a coupe line is a good idea for an SUV. It really isn't. This is the benefit you gain when you just design for space. Acres of room back here. The seating, well, it does feel a little bit should I say less refined than the seating at the front? Obviously the material selection is exactly the same, but there's even less holding me in place back here, meaning that if I'm doing a little bit of challenging riding, it's not the best rear seat experience for that. However, for around town, the seats are very firm, very supportive and comfortable. Loads of room, I'm gonna be more than happy. Let's find out if that fifth passenger can enjoy life at all. Well, it's not bad. It's not the best middle seat you ever sat in. It's very, very firm, but there is still a lot of room. So in sum, I would say, yes, you can be comfortable back here. From 575 liters to 1,396, the rear should have more than enough space. And fortunate to our driving so far, I'm really pleased that there's a button on the key fob that means I don't have to touch it. Well, as with the interior at the front, What's really pleasing to me about the first look at the rear is that it delivers on a quality that you're not fully expecting after only having looked at the aesthetic. I quite like these contrasting colors back here, and this is an already well-known but extremely useful and practical Nissan innovation, which is a split part floor from front to back. So you can actually have different levels for different bits of your floor, depending on exactly what it is that you want to put in here. Now, I guess you could think that's a little bit of a faff, and 99% of the time, you're just gonna keep these lids absolutely in place. And when they say flat, they actually do properly mean flat, which means that you've got more than enough load space back here for anything most regular people could expect to need to carry. Now, Thomas would never forgive me if I didn't give you the direct dimensions. So let's have a look. You can fit a width fitting in here of around about, well, let's be really brutal and take it down to the flat part, 41 inches or about one meter five. For depth, load space right through to the back. Well, effective back, which is obviously the lip of the load space, 36 inches or about 91 centimeters. 
and with the seat fully folded down, I'm gonna need to fully extend this. Now this is actually good because Thomas is always saying if only he had an SUV in which he could transport one of his extendable rulers without needing to collapse it in any way. Oh, Nissan didn't quite make the cut, but it's not that far off. We come up to around about 180 centimeters or about 71 inches. And I suspect you could probably actually even get a little bit more than that in there, especially depending on your size. Now, why, why did I say that? It's because of course, the smaller you are, as with my legs, the further seat actually goes forward. I wish I'd have had a camera on me, but I recently just fitted a 2.4 meter countertop into a Nissan Micra and I'm not making it up. And if anyone wants to bet me it's not possible, I'll do it again, but you'll have to pay for the new countertop. Now, if we look at the top to bottom access here, it comes in at around about 35 inches or 90 centimeters. So you almost have a full cubed meter of direct load into this thing. And thanks to the way in which it's designed, if Cornelius takes a bit of a step back, you can see that a cupboard, a chest of drawers, anything else that is huge and bulky is literally gonna slot directly into the rear of this. I've seen an awful lot of SUVs. This looks a really good proposition for loading and unloading stuff. Let's take a look and see what's powering this thing. Okay, well, what you are looking at there is a 1.5 litre three cylinder engine. And that doesn't power the car, that powers the electric battery or sends power directly to the electric motors. You have two of those, 150 kilowatt at the front and 100 kilowatts at the back. That produces a combined system output of 214 horsepower. The idea being that that petrol engine produces all the power that's necessary in order to keep the battery, which is a 2.1 kilowatt, fully topped up and running optimally to power the car. It does have a theoretical pure electric range of about three kilometers, which you can access for driving around town. So power test time. As you may remember, I mentioned earlier that if the battery can't supply what the electric motors want, the power distribution changes and the engine is now supplying the electric motors direct through the alternator. So let's see what all of that translates to. I found a bit of road with a nice hill on it. Why? We all know that three cylinder engines hate hills. And I wanna see what the most that this car can give me is. Seven seconds of promised delivery. I've put it in sports mode. I'm very excited about that. Let's put our foot down and see what happens. Ready? Ready, Cornelius? Let's go. Actually, it's not bad. It's really not bad. It's working. That seven seconds felt pretty good, actually. And you know what? I felt secure. I felt that the car was not in any way disappointing at all, actually. I have to be honest, I was expecting that to be a bit of a blowout. I thought I would put my foot down, then wait, and nothing much would happen. But you know what? It was good. Well, that was sports mode. It's only right that we try it again in standard. Same road, same incline, now standard mode. Now, Cornelius, the challenge here is you have to find in any way something that is different between this and sports. Are you ready? Yes. Let's go. And no. Any difference? No. No. Not at all. Same feeling again, though. Actually, really pleasing power delivery. I think I found my sweet spot for a larger SUV. Seven seconds. I think that's good. If you look at the power curve, in terms of what's required to make a car deliver at different levels. I want to say seven seconds is probably around about optimal once you go below that. So we did the way coffee zero one and that was five seconds. You really have to use a lot of energy to move this kind of weight and this kind of size through the air. So seven for me feels like the right power for this platform. What do you think? Well, it's about time we got out onto the road with the brand new X-Trail, or if you're watching in America, Rogue. And yes, I know, if you're watching in America, it's not quite brand new over there. But I tell you what is brand new, and that's the three cylinder, one and a half liter engine that this thing is now equipped with. So if you bought your Rogue last year in the States, 
ah, bad luck, you just missed out on this and you may well want to think about if it's worth your time upgrading. Because I have to tell you, a lot of innovation has taken place there. Yes, I know that this car has a different drive platform and is a slightly different proposition, but it's still the same one and a half liter engine that you would find in the standard internal combustion engine version. Now, on top of variable displacement, it also has the ability to deliver the most efficient version of what Nissan at least think you can achieve with a three-cylinder engine. If you have experience of driving around with a three-cylinder, that might make you grind your teeth a little bit and say, come on though, Brian, I'm just not interested in doing that. But wait, I promise you, they're really worth checking out. They're not what you think and they get better all the time. So this one in particular comes originally from Infinity. I don't know if you've ever experienced it in their car, but they've had an awful lot of time to refine this and it works really well in this platform. Now that said, that's not what this specific car has been set up to do. This specific car is the E-Force, which is a really interesting take on the proposition of hybrid. So regular viewers may know I'm not the world's biggest fan of hybrid cars. The reason being to me kind of feels like the worst of both worlds. You have to lug around twice as much equipment, twice the effective costs, and the only benefit that you get from that is an extended range. Well, okay, better fuel economy as well, but you have to drive an awful lot of miles in one to really see the value of that. So this then is a slightly different proposition. This only uses the engine to charge the battery. That's it. Now, if that sounds a bit odd, the obvious advantage to that is that you don't need to have a big battery because it is not a standard hybrid in any sense at all. So what that means in real world use is that you get a driving experience that in principle is a lot more like an electric car in some ways and a lot more like an internal combustion engine in others. Because you have a large effective range, this car should do around about you can interrupt the voice prompt and give a command. I'd love to interrupt the voice prompt, thank you. This car should have an effective range of around about 750 kilometers. Well, that's pretty great, especially for a potentially seven seat SUV. But on top of that, you're not gonna be able to charge the battery because it's so small. Well, one, there's no technology to allow you to do it, but two, the effective range of this in pure EV mode is only a slightly brilliant three kilometers. And if you think, why? Why would anyone build such a platform? As Nissan will point out to you, the vast majority of trips you ever take around town in an EV are brilliantly actually less than three kilometers. So that might end up being an awful lot more useful than you think. In real world everyday usage, however, the system is set up to work standardly like this. The petrol three cylinder, one and a half liter engine runs pretty much permanently charging the battery through obviously a current alternator. That then um, allows you to power in this car two electric motors. You have 150 kilowatts in the front and 100 in the rear, giving you a slight front wheel bias, which is not unusual at all. Now that is the electric benefit of the car that results in a performance of around about seven seconds for zero to 100. But this is where it gets a bit more complicated. If you put your foot down and really demand, now in a standard hybrid, it would use that power to drive the engine itself. In this car, what it will then do is send that power directly through the alternator to the electric motors, allowing the car to intelligently decide where its best use of that power is, either sending it direct to the battery, a proportion of it to the battery, or a proportion of it to the electric motors themselves. All of that is nothing you're gonna care about if you actually own and drive this car. It's just to give you an idea of how this technology is being applied. Real world, what all of that adds up to is that you get the power that you would want and hope for from a car this size as an electric vehicle, the range you would hope for from a hybrid, and theoretically the ease of driving and dare I say cost that you would hope to get for from the internal combustion engine. I think it's really worth considering smaller battery, massive saving on weight, makes the car much more efficient and hopefully makes it cheaper and easier to run and maintain. Okay, I'm on pretty thin ice with that one, but 
All of which is to say, I start this test drive feeling pretty positive about the proposition. I think it's a nice take on what we could be looking at as we're moving further forwards into pure electric platforms, excuse me, platforms. Now, if you consider the different options that are available for this, first of all, Cornelius is going to have a go at managing to get this charming lady to stop talking to us. <laughs> I think what's happened is that she's telling us about the menus. I think that's what's happened. There we go. So I am more than delighted to learn that they finally figured out how to bring an air of refinement into their cars. Look at this. It's great. It feels modern. It's stylish. The material selection is good. Is it going to blow your mind? No, it's really not. But you know what? It feels solid. It feels well put together. It feels stylish and it does just enough. This is the Techno line. That's one under the top, which is Techno Plus, And I think gives you just enough of the extra bells and whistles that you're probably going to want. The head up display is nice. It's not too hard to adjust. Doesn't have any automatic brightness adjustment. So on a day like today, I really had to dim it down as low as it would go. So it wasn't glaring at me, but I did like the fact that I was able to get it for once into a right position for me to drive. You got to get the Techno line or above if you want that to come on this car. Drive experience, well, you know, there's not a huge amount to get blown away by, but at the end of the day, it is a seven seat potential SUV. So you really wouldn't expect it to be too exciting to drive. What is exciting immediately right off the bat is the comfort and the build quality of this vehicle. Everything feels really well put together. And although it doesn't blow your world, it does present as being very nice. Thank you very much. I wish they'd used more of that brushed black plastic effect here instead of all of this high gloss, famously great for fingerprints. But I do appreciate the fact there are still some tactile knobs and buttons. This volume button in the middle, which allows you to adjust and mess around with it without bothering to look, that's great. And believe it or not, still tactile realistic heating and cooling controls, which ignoring the fact they're finished in high gloss black plastic, actually are super easy to address without bothering to spend any time looking at it. That combined with the head up display mean that my driving experience here really is focused on exactly that. Seats, well, they're firm and supportive. They're not amazing. Certainly they don't give me quite as much side support as I might like, but they do the job and they certainly do feel as if they're going to be comfortable over longer distances. The steering wheel itself is really good. I'm a big fan of these manual controls. It's great to have buttons. It's great that they're clearly delineated so I can easily push and adjust what I want without needing to look at it. That said, when you do it, and let's see if we can cycle through some menu options here, they do feel a bit plasticky to push on. So steering wheel seat, steering wheel controls, all echoing just a little bit of the, ah, uh, I still feel the Nissan underneath it all. But that is quite a harsh complaint. The really good thing is it all feels solid and well built and I really appreciate that. Now in terms of what you're actually going to get when you're driving around in this thing, it won't surprise you to learn that it does have a different level of regeneration and here I'm always complaining about this. I don't understand why more firms don't do what Mazda do, put it on a stalk, allow you to adjust it, and then you can have a bit more fun playing with it. Here, it's a small button irritatingly located right in the center of the console here, and it's right next to the pure EV mode, which means really irritatingly easy to hit by mistake. Nissan call it the E-pedal, and you can see if I push this, there's the regeneration. Now, it's actually not badly delivered. I think once you get used to it, you're gonna find yourself using that by way of one pedal driving an awful lot more than the brake because it's practical and it improves your efficiency. My only two real gripes are one, why? Why place it there and make it so hard to get to? Are they just assuming customers won't bother using it or they'll set it and forget it? I mean, that's not my experience of these things. I like to adjust them as I go, depending on how and where I'm driving. That's quite a lot of drag. That's all from the e-pedal, nothing from the brake at all. So I would have liked that clearer and easier to access, and I would have liked different levels of recuperation. But you know what? 
you can't have everything. 150 kilowatts in the front, 100 in the back gives us a combined system output of 214 horsepower. And if I put my foot down, Well, promises a zero to 100 time of seven seconds. That's 100 kilometers per hour or 62 miles per hour, round about there. You know, to be honest, I think that's more than sufficient. Yes, there's a little bit of delay in actually getting what you want, but it's an SUV. And this especially is an SUV that's designed to deliver efficiency, which those two things don't naturally sit happily in the same zone. So if you want a performance, come on, Porsche makes some really amazing cars. But how often are you really gonna be putting your foot down? Now I started off this clip by asking, is it possible for you to save the money? Are the non-German models now coming to a level where you can realistically say, you know what, I'm not gonna feel bad shame and in actual fact, I can get what I want from a cheaper model. Well, I would have loved for the answer to that to honestly have been yes, but the answer is, well, kind of. On the upside, the finish in fit out of this is superb. If I put this against a more reasonable direct competition, which would be the Toyota RAV4, I have to tell you, I think it wins. As is so often the case with Toyota, I kind of want to say in the pure agricultural sturdiness of the engine and the layout, Toyota have the edge. But in terms of refinement and the finish of the vehicle and your enjoyment of ownership, I'm going to give it to Nissan. And that's important because it means you are then entering a region in which you're looking at more expensive German models that before simply hasn't been remotely possible. While we're on the subject of talking about comparing this car to higher models, everyone's familiar with the jog shuttle wheel on older Mercedes and of course the ability to be able to change between modes. Well, this car rather charmingly also has different driving modes. Why do I say rather charmingly? Well, there's a sports mode on it. I'm not massively ambitious about that, but let's check it out and see what happens. That sports, I'm currently driving 80 kilometers. Let's put the foot flat down and see what happens. Okay, any difference Cornelius? Let's by direct comparison put that straight back into standard mode. No. And 80 again, foot flat down. I think no difference. I think that is 100% the same. I don't really know why they put different driving modes onto cars like this. I don't really see the benefit. But that said, this is four wheel drive and there is a snow mode and a rain mode. So possibly you'll find some use out of those. Here we are in standard mode, no problem at all. I think, to be honest, for the most time you own this vehicle, you'll just stick it in standard and forget about it. So we've done a really interesting series of looks of late at cars performing in segments you wouldn't necessarily expect them to perform in. I was very impressed by the Coffee Zero One. If you haven't seen it, check that out. I think that this car performs very well in the segment in which it finds itself. So is this gonna convert somebody who really drives an Audi, a BMW, a Mercedes? No, that's the honest answer, no it isn't. But it is gonna convert somebody who's just gotten sick and tired of paying the premium purchase price and the servicing as well. When you compare this to a reasonable field, which has more similar marks in it, it actually does very well indeed. And the fact is, after you've finished driving up and down your street at high speed in a Macan S, there's only so many times you can do that before you go to the garage and then have to pay the cost for doing that. That might change the way that you think about this car. What I can tell you is, I'm genuinely excited about this new take on the hybrid platform. I think it's a really good solution. It's always irked me driving around with massive weight increase because of batteries, especially if you're in a non-EV. And none of that applies here. It looks, feels, and handles like what you would say in Europe is a larger SUV, and obviously in the States is a compact SUV. And I think it speaks very well to all of the markets it operates in. So there's not enough here to make it distinct and unique. But what there is, is everything finished really well. Is this the fastest SUV? No. Is it the most economic SUV? No. 
is it the most sporty or the most fun? No, no to everything. It doesn't excel in any single field I can think of except one. It does the best across all of those levels. If you put them all together and you say, what do I really want from buying a car like this? And the answer to that question is, I want to be comfortable, I want to feel safe, I want to have a car that's going to hold its value and feel solidly well built. And I never want to have to deal with range anxiety ever again. You know what? There is an awful lot compelling you to take a look at this. I like it. Yeah, it's not going to be my car of choice for any one of the reasons, but put them all together and it's really a very nice proposition indeed. So which one would I take home today and which one would you take home today? Tell me in the comments. The VW Tiguan is the most silent drive and it has the best suspension. It drives better than all the others and has a high range plug-in hybrid. The Škoda Kodiak, of course, being built on the very same platform, is more or less the same vehicle. Of course, different exterior, different interior, and it is bigger, it has most space available. Later on, there will also be the VW Tyron for the European market, which will then be the somewhat similar VW Tiguan for the Northern American market. And they are then approximately the size also of the Škoda Kodiak. So they are actually best in the driving feeling overall. They give the most sophisticated drive. The Peugeot 3008 has the most dramatic exterior and interior. And if you need a pure EV, there this version here offers a large battery and high range. The Toyota RAV4 has the best reliability rankings. It's actually also a very decent vehicle, has enough space, especially low entry price on the Northern American market. However, the thing is that it is quite loud at higher speeds on the motorway. The Mazda CX-5 has also good reliability rankings and it's actually quite compact and has a lot of fun in driving. However, then it doesn't have too much space on the rear bench. The Honda CRV has the best user interface in this test, I feel, and a premium interior indeed. Prices are, however, too high in Europe. They are all right again in the Northern American market, where you also can get better entry-level versions. The siblings Kia Sportage and Hyundai Tucson are great all-rounders and should also be worth considering. Definitely you should check out the prices and compare. They have done a lot of things right and they are very well usable cars and they are also very straightforward. The Nissan X-Trail is also one of the best sellers of Nissan because it has a very good package. Overall, they all do deliver an attractive offer with their respective strength. If you're going for a lease, especially in Europe, and want to have the best driving experience and drive motorway a lot and also at higher speeds, the Tiguan actually wins this aspect together with the Kodiak. So they are also very silent on the motorway. They perform very good at higher speeds in comparison to the others. If you want to buy and keep long term, I would consider a Mazda CX-5 for good driving fun. If it is okay for you that it doesn't have too much space, especially in the rear compartment. If you can live with a rather bad noise insulation at higher speeds and the sometimes sluggish CVT, the Toyota RAV4 is still the reliability king. So as for the recent reliability factors and rankings, the RAV4 together with Toyota for the whole brand still always very good in long-term reliability. So if you do a lot of lower speed and want to keep the vehicle for long, the RAV4 will probably make you least hassle. It really depends on going for a lease, going for buy, keeping it long-term, and what do you drive and how fast do you drive, and then you can actually decide which one is the best for you. What would be your spontaneous pick? Tell me in the comments.